I'll knock that over. I have my laptop, so Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So I want to introduce uh, Mark. Uh, I, I only met Mark for the first time last night, so I'm going to read kind of his bio, but it's uh, not meant to be. Uh, <laughs> Not, uh, it's more that I don't know his background as much. So, um, Mark Murakami is the founder and owner of Embark Tech Consulting Inc., uh, a results focused business strategy and sales company that helps business owners and professionals successfully navigate and grow the Canadian pet industry. As a partner to his clients with a proven track record of success, Mark offers business advice and insights alongside targeted sales support to accelerate his clients' goals. Before starting his consultancy, Mark spent two years as an owner-operator in the manufacturing of dehydrated treats and frozen raw pet foods for dogs and cats, running three locations across Canada. During his time there, he led the business through a series of growth transitions and created the fastest growing brand of frozen, pet, uh, frozen raw pet food in Canada, taking it from zero to a million dollars in revenue in a year. Prior to that, Mark owned um, a global pet food store for six years, turning it into a top performing location for the franchise. During that time, he developed an in-depth understanding of the pet owner's consumer and value, uh, valuable re relationships with sales professionals and distributors in the industry. Mark enjoys motorcycle trips to the US and finding win-win solutions to solve his business challenges for his friends and clients. And now he got to eat at Rudder's last night and had some seafood. Our joke last night was a couple of people at the table ordered steak. And they asked him how many cows, uh, how many beef cattle they saw in, in Yarmouth since they've been here. And, uh, and soon I uh, made fun of them enough that they won't order steak again in Yarmouth. So the only seafood in Yarmouth. So, so I'd like to welcome <coughs> Mark and uh, he'll, he'll share some wealth of information with us. Yeah, Doug. Doug will go away. It's on the stick, I think. Mark. Oops. Oh, I guess I'll buy the computer. Oh, okay. Just press play. Oh. Uh, start the slide showing. Where? Okay. Right there. there you go. There you go. Awesome. <laughs> so it's good to be here. Always nice to come out um, east. Uh, yeah, I've had the opportunity over the last year to come out here quite frequently. So. Um, change of pace, nice people out here. I'm actually from Mississauga, Ontario, so a little more intense there. It's always nice to come out here. Um, so as Doug said, I'm gonna talk about uh, the pet food industry in general, kind of where it's going, what trends, um, and the last thing I'm gonna talk about is kind of how to enter the market, uh, what the market's looking for, and steps to be, like steps you can take to get involved in this um, industry, which is quite a large industry and, and, and an exciting one as well. So um, Doug already introduced me, but I'll go quickly through my, um, I guess my bio again. Uh, as my university education, I guess I have a Bachelor of Mathematics, always interested in numbers, which was a driving factor in what I'm doing now in the consulting and always a driving factor behind uh, what I'm doing uh, in business because it is about uh, it's about finding win-win solutions but at the same time driving that bottom line driving profitability and there's no other way to look at it other than using mathematics and numbers so uh, before getting into the pen industry I was actually a high school math teacher so um, <coughs> got to <laughs> kind of teach kids for six years then that was a lot of uh, high school kids by then, so kind of exited that and got into the pet uh, pet industry, starting with uh, Global Pet Foods. Uh, I purchased that store, turned it around, as Doug said, uh, and then I kind of was found the pet food like the pet store was limiting, like it was in Brampton, Ontario. I only had that little geographic region. I wanted to branch out, do something bigger, reach more people. So that's what inspired me to get into the manufacturing. I figured. If I can get into pet food manufacturing, I can bring it across Canada, um, get the opportunity to travel, network, and um, grow something larger than what I was able to do with a, a single retail location. So that was my motivating factor in getting into the, the manufacturing. The other motivation behind it was seeing the difference that 
um, different types of food made in the animals. So I focused on raw food sales in my store and seeing customers come in day after day and the difference that the raw food <coughs> made in the pet's lives, that inspired me to get into the actual manufacturing of raw food um, to kind of <laughs> bring it, make it more accessible to everybody. So I did run three locations. Um, two of them were in the same place, so it's kind of four locations, but realistically three locations, two in St. Thomas, one in Edmonton, one in Saskatoon. Um, and right now I'm, I'm, I've left manufacturing. A lot of you maybe here are, I met some last night, are in the manufacturing business. Manufacturing is never easy, it's always interesting. Um, so I've gra graduated from manufacturing onto consulting. It gives me more of an opportunity to dabble with the manufacturing, but less, when I was in manufacturing, I was literally in manufacturing to the degree of like, I was operating my thermal former and filling packages of meat. And it was a good experience, but um, I like to help businesses uh, rather than work the line when I need to. So um, I love growing business. I love everything about business. This is why I want to be involved with as many businesses as possible. Um, I kind of have a reputation for being challenging. Um, I prefer to be called more of a critical thinker. And it's because I'm always looking for a win-win solution. I, I believe there's always working with good people. There's always a chance to collaborate and kind of find mutually beneficial opportunities where you can grow a kind of everybody's bottom line working together. So that's a bit about myself. Uh, as I said, it's an exciting in industry. So it's literally raining cats and dogs. Um, the ownership rate in Canada is increasing. 61% of Canadians own a pet. And what's interesting about this is it's, it, there's <coughs> geographic locations play a big role in the ownership rate of, um, of dogs and cats. I was just talking to someone I'm working with who has an Arctic char farm up in Whitehorse. And he was telling me that when you go to Whitehorse, the population there, the people there, they all have like three massive dogs. Um, so the actual the dog ownership in Whitehorse is proportionally is quite high. When I was a teacher, I was teaching um, math in a town called Orangeville, Ontario. Outside of the GTA, like smaller community. Um, but the dog ownership there, I remember as a teacher when I was there, um, all the kids had their cell phones out even though they weren't supposed to, but on their screens of the cell phone, their background picture, dog after dog after dog. And I'm like, this is really interesting. And later on when I had my global pet foods, um, turns out that the global pet foods in Orangeville, Ontario, is the number two selling global pet foods in the entire chain. So whereas you would think that maybe like somewhere like Toronto, who has the population density to really drive up sales there would be number one. It's these smaller towns um, that tend to have, you know, depending on the dog ownership rate there, large <coughs> amounts of sales. Um, regarding global pet foods, the, it, relating it back to the, uh, the Maritimes, New Brunswick, the, the globals in New Brunswick owned by the Kelly family, um, those are global's top performers. So the top performing globals do not come from the GTA. Um, they're driven by New Brunswick and Orangeville, Ontario. <laughs> um, our demographics, where we're going, um, people like dogs and cats, period. There's no real bias. Men compared to women, they equally buy dogs and cats or own dogs and cats. Uh, we're starting to see now that millennials are surpassing the baby boomers uh, in terms of getting a pet. Maybe, I mean, uh, your dating profile looks really good if your profile picture has a dog in it. <laughs> but statistically, you go way up in terms of getting hits. So, um, Melania is kind of using, like, couples are kind of using the, the dog cat as your starter family. So, they kind of Let's get a dog, see how that goes before having kids. <laughs> um, baby boomers, it's kind of the same deal. Now that the kids have left the nest, they, like, baby boomers need someone to take care of. Kids are out of the option, not an option, so let's get a dog and treat it as, you know, treat it as part of the family. How can we spoil it the same way that we spoil 
for the children. Mm. Uh, so, in terms of pet food, there's an evolution happening in the pet food industry. Um, you'll see on my slides here, out with the old, in with the new. Uh, when, when we were feeding our animals back in the day, long ago, it was kind of table scraps, right? You would feed the family, whatever scraps were left over, you throw that outside for the dog, because, I mean, a lot of the dogs and cats and stuff lived outside, barn dogs, barn cats. Um, they lived off table scraps, which, ironically, with uh, coming full circle, table scraps are a pretty good diet for, for animals, like for dogs and cats. I mean, they did quite well on, on that diet. Um, but for convenience reasons, and economic opportunities, we need, there was this shift towards uh, the commercial pet food, you know, how can we um, sell pet food to consumers? So we got into canned food, and companies started making, you know, this wet canned food, which was more convenient, um, still in line with like using real ingredients and everything. This is way back before, you know, companies looked for shortcuts. Um, but making a healthy canned food diet that just brought convenience to to the end consumer. And then, then we got into the dry pet food, the kibble industry, which again, increased, like reduced cost for the consumer, increased convenience of feeding, and that's where everything kind of exploded. All different kinds of kibbles, kibbles that are different colors, different nutritional values. Um, and then we rode the kibble chain for a while, and kibble obviously, as you know, still is highly prevalent as a means of feeding your animal. Uh, recently, in the last, I mean, couple years, maybe the last seven years, I would say, seven, ten years, there's a new generation or a new type of food that are gaining uh, a lot of traction in the market. Um, foods such as, on the left there, you'll see, that's freeze-dried food. So, uh, the idea or the trend is to reduce the amount of processing on the, uh, the food that we're feeding our animals, and it's aligning itself with the human food trend. So as, as we as humans are trying to eat less processed food to be healthier, uh, that in turn is flowing down to our animals. Because our animals are our children, we're now saying, well, if my diet needs to be less processed uh, so that I can be healthier, my child or my fur child's diet also needs to be less processed so that they can be achieve the health benefits that I'm achieving. So there's a, uh, different ways of achieving this. So one of the ways is freeze drying. In the middle, you have dehydrated. So less processing, there's dehydrated <coughs> kibble, so to speak. So it looks like kibble, but it's not processed in the same way that kibble is. And then what sparked my interest is the raw food. Um, feeding unprocessed food to your animal. And that concept being driven, like if you look at the wolves, so to speak, Blue Buffalo did an amazing marketing campaign on associating the wild wolf with the dog. And you know, your dog needs to eat what dogs or wolves in the wild would eat. And then they pan to kibble, which is interesting. But realistically, what's a wolf eating in the wild? It's eating an animal. And after it kills its prey, it doesn't start a campfire and cook the animal over the fire. It just eats it raw. So we have the, uh, this raw food um, continues to grow, probably the fastest growing um, segment within the industry. Uh, so in terms of the retail layout, uh, pet food, this, these types of pet food can be found in many different channels. Uh, as I said, I've had experience in kind of the pet specialty retail channel uh, through Global Pet Foods, but you can also find it basically everywhere. Everyone, every retailer kind of wants, uh, because of the growth in the industry and the dollar value size of the industry, all retailers are trying to get a piece of the pie. So you see your mass. Uh, stores getting into pet food, farm and feed stores, it naturally makes sense to expand their pet food selection. The vets are kind of under attack on this front because they used to have more of a stronghold. Um, people used to get their, more of their food from the vet because the vet was a trusted you know, source of knowledge for their animal, but 
people now more and more doing their own research online and finding out that vet food might not be the best food for their animals. So vet, I, I would say that the vet food sales of, in terms of food are declining. Um, even internet, like in the US, you have Chewy.com, which is an online only um, avenue for getting food. But there's also like food producers who sell directly over the internet only, and they do kibble, or there's also raw businesses that are direct to consumer that use the internet as their sales channel. You won't find them in a, a retail location per se. So lots of different um, retail avenues. In terms of the size of the market on uh, at, at the retail level, this is like a little bit older data, but this is the last study that kind of I had access to. So in 2015, we're looking at 2034 pet specialty retailers um, in Canada. Uh, and you'll notice like PetSmart's up there. So we're including like PetSmart as a pet specialty retailer. Um, sometimes if you're in the industry, uh, the pet specialty segment of the industry doesn't like to include PetSmart. They'd like to include them in the big box, but for the purposes of this study, they included um, big stores like PetSmart. How would that compare to the US? Like I guess proportionally, obviously there'd be a lot, many, many more, but proportionally, I guess. I'm not <coughs> sure. Yeah, like usually, generally, you multiply by 10, but yeah. um, I'm not, I don't have that no. data specifically. Okay. So the difference, though, I can tell you a differentiator between Canada and the U.S. The U.S. is adopted like online a lot more than Canada. Mm. So Canada's been protected on the retail front, so to speak, because of the cost of shipping. It's really hard to ship a 30 pound bag of dog food in Canada. <coughs> it's also really, really hard to ship frozen food yeah. to the consumer in Canada. Mm. Um, in the US, they have much more favorable shipping rates. So that's where like a company like Chewy doesn't operate in Canada because the cost of shipping mm. prevents it from that. So all different retail chains, lots of uh, different avenues. So one avenue to enter the market is to get endorsed or adopted by a chain, so to speak. So um, like, let's say there's a chain called Tailblazers based at their head office is in Kelowna, out west. Um, if they were to like pick up a food or a product that you were doing, um, other chains and other independent stores then notice that and you can kind of grow yourself in the industry that way. So if you can find an inroad into a specific chain, that's one avenue of entering the market. Um, I included this slide, just it breaks down, um, just so we can talk about specifically Nova Scotia here. We're looking at about 55 stores, um, equally broken down between like large stores compared to small stores. Um, so your local mom and pops, pet food independent place, like Mark's Pet Store would be probably a small store, you know, 1,000, 2,000 square feet compared to a large store like a PetSmart where it's just, you know, your 20,000 square foot store that kind of has everything. So in terms of the scope, I mentioned in the beginning that there's a lot a, of uh, money in this industry. And if you've been following kind of like uh, in, on the investment side of the industry in terms of acquisitions <coughs> and investments, um, you'll notice the most recent largest deal that happened was the acquisition of Blue Buffalo by General Mills for $8 billion. Billion? Billion. B billion? B billion. Wow. So <laughs> there's a lot of money in the pet food industry, um, and that's why you'll see some of these companies like Mars, Nestle, General Mills, they're all looking to get a part of this massive industry. Um, because this industry, not only is it <coughs> continuously growing, but it's also kind of recession proof. So no one really cuts spending on their children. Hey, um, you know, Johnny, you're not gonna eat today because we're in a recession. Like, that's the last thing they cut. So because our dogs and cats are our children, we still spend money on them. We will cut everything else before we will cut, you know, their food and their the things that make their lives better. So that's kind of the scope that we're dealing with. These are all U.S. companies, um, massive, massive amounts of money. Obviously, they operate in Canada as well. Um, to to get involved with one of these large players, you yourself 
most likely have to be a large player because the amount of food that you know and that um, Blue Buffalo is pumping out requires a supply chain that can support that volume of food. So you yourself kind of have to be at that level where you can provide the you know tens of thousands of pounds per week or whatever day a week that it, that they require to manufacture their food. Most likely, when you're dealing with these guys, you're also going through like a third party because if you're if you're the actual like fishery that's got the you know the um, the raw ingredients, they haven't been processed yet, so it would need to get rendered or something like that to go into a kibble. So, more specifically, I'm interested in Canada. What about Canada? Um, I would say the largest player here is a company called Champion Pet Foods. I don't know if you've heard of them. They're out of Edmonton, Alberta. Um, a very nice success story for Canada. Um, in 2017, their revenue was kind of around the 180 million mark. So definitely doing very, very well. Um, estimates, it's estimated that they own basically like 5% of the, um, the pet specialty market. Um, I can tell you as a Global Pet Foods, um, a lot of the Global Pet Foods franchises, um, I'd say 25 to 50% of their revenue came from the sales of Champions products. Uh, that's that's the degree to which they kind of were involved in the market. There's also other players. Um, you may have run into a, a company called Corey Nutrition Company out of Fredericton, New Brunswick. So they do um, they do a food, a local food there. Um, well, not local, but it's distributed across Canada. But they they're local to us in the Maritimes here. Uh, they also co-pack as well, so they do have their own kitchen. So in the pet industry, we don't call our manufacturing facilities facilities or anything like that. It's all about the kitchen. We're cooking in the kitchen for your animal, right? Even though it's really a manufacturing plant. Um, out of Brampton, actually, which is close to where I'm, uh, where I'm in Mississauga, we have the Crump Group. Uh, more treats focused, but now getting into that new era of food. So they're kind of doing an air-dried food. Uh, also a very successful company. Uh, Elmira, uh, just outside of the GTA, they're a large producer of uh, kibble, and they co-pack as well. And in fact, the company below them, Hecturian, uh, basically has created their own mini manufacturing plant inside <coughs> their plant. And that's because I'll talk to later the trends that, that's happening in the industry and the regulations and things like that. Um, so to meet some of these trends and regulations Pet Curian, that Pet Curian wants, they needed to kind of build their own manufacturing inside Elmira's manufacturing because Elmira's wouldn't um, meet some of the necessary requirements they were looking for. PLB, another player. The Tableau is out of the West, uh, on the West Coast. <coughs> A great company as well. Um, they own, they're one of the only companies that owns a cannery. So they can actually make their own dog cans. Whereas if you're another, I guess, player in the industry, you would have to outsource and get someone to make do your cans for you. So, um, the reason why I have a can up here is because what I thought was interesting, what Champion Pet Food did, like they're brilliant at marketing, for like for sure. Um, but what they started to do with the humanization of the pet food, you'll notice this guy up here. And because it's hard to read, I wrote it down there, but it says, that's Gary of Celtic Seafoods in Port Hardy of British Columbia. He's their trusted supplier of fresh wild caught herring. So, I mean, if you have, uh, if, you're, if you have access to like your fish or whatever, if you're in the fish industry and you can, you know, get in contact with Champion Pet Foods, they, what they, they're, what they're going to want to do is they're going to want to take, you know, your picture on the boat or something like that on the dock, and they're going to put it right on their marketing material, right on their website. In fact, if you flip the bag over, you're going to see one of the farmers or fishermen that's involved in, um, in getting it in ingredients for their products. And it's brilliant. I think it's brilliant because they're really bringing that, like, farm to table idea um, right to the consumer. So it, it builds a lot of trust. 
Because I mean, realistically, and I'll talk to a little bit later in my presentation about the regulations in the industry, we don't actually know that they're like, we're just taking it on faith. I mean, Champion yeah, printed it on bag. Did anyone fact check it? They are a good company, so I'm, I'm assuming it's true, but I mean, it still needs a picture on bag. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how pet food's made now, um, starting with the meat ingredients, because a lot of us here are dealing with seafood. Um, there's this battle in the pet industry about where the ingredients should come from, um, fresh versus meat meal. It's The trend is more and more moving towards fresh meat, which is good for all of us because when you have your pet, you know, on the dog or you eat your seafood, um, there's a demand for that, like that fresh food without having to say, send it to a renderer. And then, so you can get involved like, you know, the area of Celtic seafoods or whatever, you can, be the one selling direct to the, uh, the pet food manufacturer. Uh, so the reason why meat meal is bad is it, it's, it's rendered so you don't know what's in it. It like, goes off, goes into this black hole, comes out as a powder. Um, what the pet food industry is uh, moving towards is having 100% traceable. So that's where Champion in my last example comes in and says, if you want to know where the herring comes from, it comes from dairy. And that, you know, gives you the sense of, oh, this, this, like, this is, I, I would feed my dog this because when I go to the grocery store, I want to know where my, where my um, <coughs> fish is coming from. Uh, <coughs> there's nutritional aspects as well. So fresh is better. It's more nutritious versus if it's been rendered once. I mean, the more you process food, um, the more nutritional value you lose. So, and then we're talking also about sustainability, which I'm sure is uh, uh, one of the hot topics out here. Like, well, last night we were talking about like the lobster shell waste and like how we can make things more sustainable and, and use everything um, fully. And yeah, it's just cooked, fresh is cooked less meat meal because of the rendering process cooking a lot more. In terms of manufacturing, there's a bunch of different types of manufacturing that I'm just going to briefly cover. So the first, it goes from, I kind of structured it from the most processed to the least processed. So we start off with extrusion. Um, that's your typical like large scale operation. So that is where a company like Blue Buffalo would have, you know, this massive automated operation, um, bringing, you know, hundreds of thousands of pounds of dry and wet goods, uh, raw ingredients going into this big hopper that uh, gets all mixed together to meet their um, <coughs> guaranteed analysis requirements. Um, and then, then it goes through like kind of the worst process, which is the extruder. So where heat and pressure are applied to it. Um, that's the reason why I say it's the worst process is because from a consumer standpoint, because consumers are becoming more and more educated, uh, what that means to the end consumer is you're you're destroying nutrients, and what we want to do as pet parents is we want to give our we want to maximize the amount of nutrients we're giving to our animals. So by applying pressure and heat, you're just taking that nutrients away. Um, and then the kid will once it finishes extrusion process dry. Yeah. But manufacturers do that probably to destroy bacteria and to make it shelf stable. I'm guessing, or or is it just yeah. Yeah. Okay. turning it into kibble okay. the heat is what makes like the safety so from a regulatory standpoint applying a certain like a, a high degree of heat to it that's what kills all the bacteria mm. um, and makes it safe so yeah so basically you brought up an interesting point because there's this <coughs> battle in the pet industry between like kibble and raw for the, exactly that point, like raw is unprocessed, so what about all the bacteria, all the salmonella, all that, versus, you know, a kibble, it's gone through all these processes, there's nothing, mm. nothing really harmful about it. So, I'll talk a little bit to that point um, in a bit. Uh, so then you it just finishes the process, like, it sticks kibble, dries, coating, which is usually the spray on the oil, that makes it more palatable. Um, adds back some of the nutrients that you killed in the extrusion process, and then package off to the stores kind of mm -hmm. thing. Oven bake, very similar, except you skip the extrusion process. So 
uh, some companies, like of the tradition or Tibet, uh, their differentiating factor that they sell their food on is we don't use extrusions, we bake our food. So they make the little table shapes, put it through an oven, less heat, no pressure. Um, mm. There are drains. Our food is giving your dog more nutrients because we're not extruding it. Mm. Uh, next, dehydrated and freeze dried. So dehydration dehydration is um, the same kind of where you're going to it's no different than dehydrating something in your oven like you can do it at home yourself I mean uh, ironically one of the, the tree company that I used to own um, the way it started was you know at home someone was getting got, got hold of some beef lung and cut that beef lung into strips stuck it in the oven low at low heat for a little while came out dehydrated and their dog loved it and they're like this is interesting I need to go to um, Bass Pro Shops and buy a dehydrator so you get the little Cabela's dehydrator and then you stick that in your garage or basement and then you, you have your little saw and you're sawing some beef lung and a brain dehydrator and you're like hey my friends are starting to buy this and then that turns into huh maybe you go to some shows and every, people start buying it and you're like okay well now I need to scale up so you buy like more of the Cabela's dehydrators, you know, and uh, maybe a facility to put them in. Once in a while, they catch on fire. <laughs> but then to really scale up, and to when I got involved with that tree company, um, we had uh, I don't know if anyone's familiar with like the tobacco kilns from the tobacco industry, but what it looks like is a big shipping container, like the steel box, the big door you open, and that had a, a heater and a motor on. what gets you to the level of um, where your distributor across Canada is PetSmart. So one of our clients is PetSmart. They've been in Costco. Um, you got to start really pumping out some volume when you're talking about Costco. Um, so just low heat dry for a longer period of time. So our dehydration process, we were looking at one day or two days it was sitting in the dehydrator. Um, again, we're moving towards less and less processing. So dehydration, less processing than extrusion and um, oven baking. Uh, then, I think uh, Stella and Chewy's was the first company that I was introduced to that started this freeze drying process. They're out of the U.S., um, rock solid company. But freeze drying is a process where you have your raw food, um, you shape it, flash freeze it basically, and then put it into this thing called like a freeze dryer. That unbelievably expensive equipment. But what you're doing is then you're withdrawing all the um, the moisture from the food. Um, and it creates an un, it hasn't been um, compromised in terms of processing, so all the nutrient value is still there. But what you've done is you've evaporated all the water. So that's kind of cool because um, water is weight. So from a shipping standpoint, you've now created a food that's kind of, that's the same essentially as a raw food, but it doesn't weigh as much. It also doesn't need to be frozen. So uh, one of the uh, the major challenges that's, I would say, isn't really solved right now to date in the pet food industry is shipping raw food across the country. Uh, it costs a lot of money to get reefer trucks to pick up raw food, and realistically, like you're building skids of raw food that are only made in like 2,000 to <coughs> 2,500 pounds each skid. You should, basically, I always had to do 27 to 40 cents a pound on the food I was selling just to compensate for the shipping. So if someone came up with a solution to transport raw food effectively across the company, uh, country, there's a there's kind of an opportunity there to make some money because that's the, the, that's the worst problem for a raw food manufacturers in Canada. But wouldn't it make more sense to do it look for your local resources and sell from there? Yes. Versus transporting? Right. So one of the, one of the solutions is um, open facilities across the country and that way and along the lines of what Champion Pet Foods is doing it's taking their idea of like locally sourced ingredients putting it in the food um, you could do that in the raw industry as well so you could have like some BC sourced fish on the west coast but some maritime sourced fish on the east coast and essentially have different formulations so Champion did that in Kibble 
um, when they opened their Kentucky location in the U.S. Uh, so the Pacifica that I showed you there previously, that's the Canadian version of their fish food. Um, if you go to the U.S. where Kentucky's manufacturing it, their fish formula is a catfish. So they use catfish as their source for fish. Um, it's kind of cool, but it, that's exactly how you salt. If you're not going to ship, then you open facilities. The yeah. problem, I guess, would be when you're starting off, because it's the same thing as what I described with dehydrating. Like, my dog has a problem. This is, I'm going to give you the, the story of how a raw food manufacturer starts. You know, you have your dog, Suki. Suki has a problem. She, her fur's falling out. Oh my god, but Suki's my child. I need to do everything in my power to fix Suki. So you then like, well, I'm just I'm gonna go to I'm gonna go to Sobeys and I'm gonna just buy food from Sobeys and make Suki some meals and then all of a sudden Suki's fur comes back and you're like, wow, this me cooking for Suki is amazing. It helps her. I need to help other animals. So you're like, I'm gonna start cooking this for my friends and family. And then your friends and family tell other people, now all of a sudden, well, my kitchen's too small. I need to find some space and make a little mini kitchen there. And then it grows up from there. Um, but then you hit this point where it's really hard to scale up. So like the thermal former, for example, costs $200,000. It's, it's hard to go from like kitchen in a little rented space to, okay, I'm gonna just uh, take go to my savings account, drop the 200K, that's just for the thermal former. I need 100K for the, you know, the VMAG portioner. Um, not, not many companies like scale up and bank enough money and capital to do that. Um, so what they do is they end up being like, well, I'm gonna manufacture what I can manufacture here and I'm gonna try and then ship it because I don't have the capital to actually. But the right way to do it, I agree with you, would be if you have the capital behind you, open up a rock solid like facility in Maritimes, open one in Ontario, and open one in either BC or Alberta. Then you have three bases of which to produce the food. The other interesting thing about that idea is you also have um, the ability to source meat. So the pro one of the problems I ran into when I was manufacturing raw food in St. Thomas, Ontario, is I started using all the meat available to me around St. Thomas, Ontario. So lamb, for example, like I, I actually ran out of lamb. I'm like, I don't have any more lamb. And I could get more lamb, but the problem is now I'm competing with the human chain. Yeah. And the pricing going from like the waste lamb products to, okay, I need to actually buy what's, what would have gone to Sobeys. I'm gonna buy that to fulfill my lamb demand. Um, it's not, not really cost feasible. Yeah. Versus if you had a facility out west In terms of freeze drying, so freeze drying is a raw alternative, so they wouldn't add anything. So the concept behind raw feeding is don't process it at all. So you make your recipes, um, so you would have maybe your fruits and your veggies and all that stuff, but then you wouldn't process it any further, so you wouldn't add anything. And because it is mostly pure meat, um, the animals love it anyways. So typically like a freeze dried food or freeze dried treat would be more palatable than any a problem with um, so like there were featuring herring I'm assuming they're not shipping the whole herring um, they're using herring for food for human food and they're sending waste uh, it, that's an interesting question because Champion will have you believe that yes they are using the whole herring so when you go to the trade shows and you see Champion's booth um, one of their very nice displays like maybe last year the year before I'm not sure if they still do it but when you walk into their booth, they have this nice wooden kind of table with ice buckets, like not buckets, but like ice like you'd see in the grocery store. And you've got your herring and your trout, literally the whole fish laying out. And what they're conveying or the message they're sending to uh, the consumers is, this is what you're getting in our food. You're getting that whole fish. I do believe they use um, like the whole fish and they will tell you they do use the whole fish. 
and then it's interesting. So later on, if when I'm saying how you guys can get involved in the industry, one of the ways is you need to look at the costs of um, look at how much dollars you can get from the human chain versus how many dollars you can get from the pet chain. If the pet chain, if the pet channel is willing to pay more than the human channel, then if I was a business and it's like, well, these guys are going to buy my whole fish, I don't actually have to process it. Um, and they're gonna pay close to or more money. It might even be the case where because I don't have to process it, I actually make more dollars going pet than I do going the human chain. I'm just wondering if the, if the, the manufacturers care because if you're getting the same nutrient density in, in your byproduct, in your waste product, um, you don't get the uh, same nutrient. Like you. When you take like when you take all the fillets off and sell the racks, it changes the nutrient profile of the huh? yeah. So, um, but one of the, one of the, the guys I'm working with, um, that Arkachar out of the Yukon, he supplies Champion Pet Foods. And I was talking to him like two days ago because I had this talk coming up. The interesting thing he mentioned to me was he sells his Arkachar frames right. or racks yeah. to Champion. So. Although I'm sure they do use the whole fish as well, the Arctic char is the rat. So. Is there any part of the waste that they can't eat? They can't? Yeah. Uh, in, in terms of fish? Yeah, yeah. Uh, like certain times of the year you have more roast or the bellies will be full of, of food. Um, is there any aspect of part of the fish they can't eat? <coughs> in terms of fish, um, there's pr they eat, it's all good. When you get into other animals, there's obviously like there's parts that you can't use, but for seafood, um, you're pretty you're good to go. Mm -hmm. So the last two um, manufacturing processes is your frozen raw and your freshly frozen. So this is kind of the, the newest, latest, and greatest in the pet food industry. So frozen raw is exactly what it sounds like. It's literally raw food. You made your recipe, put your recipe together. So essentially that looks like you dump your meat into a grinder, you dump your veggies into a grinder, whatever else you want in the food. It all goes in the grinder, comes out. You probably put it in your grinder again as another step of mixing in a finer grind, and then it gets frozen and you sell it. So minimal processing. And that, that's where the, the argument comes up, well, how safe is it? Um, the dogs digest, like, what I always said when I was in retail is like, dogs eat their own food. So you're talking to me about like, oh, the raw food is gonna make my dog sick. Well, I mean, it would make me sick if I ate it, but I don't eat my own food. <laughs> so I, the, a dog's digestive system is built differently. They're able to consume raw food with no risk really of, of getting sick, so to speak. Um, and then they're getting the benefits of the not having it processed. Um, something I thought that was cool, um, specifically for this talk, was you'll see a product here, just the whole fish again. So that's that's um, a company out of BC. Um, they sell whole herring, uh, and actually one of their you know better selling skews. Uh, skews. So yeah. Um, not only dogs. So I don't know how are frozen raw products fed to animals. So you would take it out of your freezer and let it thaw in your fridge, and then you would give it to your dog, and it would literally consume it. Yeah. And dogs like fish yes. as well as cats. Dogs yes. love fish. I think there's That's actually a treat for a greyhound. So we give them a whole raw um, for the sardine. Yeah. But what's interesting is, so we do raw food. Um, the meat has um, beef organs, meat with veggies, then there's chicken necks and the rest. And then we can buy it all. Now, both of those are separate. We have to have two separate stores. It's interesting that where we get that, it doesn't have the fish as well. Oh. The fish he does. Oh. And they're all meat. Both of them are meat sellers for humans, but they haven't linked the two together. So I think that's, some are not seeing raw food in this region, perhaps, is an important part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, good point. The way it works in Canada, generally speaking, is in terms of, like, your, um, adoption of the trends in the industry, there's um, a shift from the west to the east. 
So Western Canada is very much into raw feeding. Um, you don't really run into the problem that you're describing when you go into like stores, they have the raw meat and like herring, chicken necks, all these other ingredients that you can add to your food. Um, it's good, it's, I like that you brought that up because another kind of fad is like, especially with the millennials, is it's become a thing where you're like, you're the chef connoisseur for your pet. So what you do is you take this raw meat out, you get your nice shiny looking bowl, you put, you do like, you know, presentation is everything. So you, you put it all out, you garnish it, you garnish it with like maybe a chicken neck or a sardine. And then you get your phone out and you take a picture, it goes on Instagram and you're like, wow, you're the best pet parent ever. Like, look at, look at that gourmet meal you just fed to your dog. Um, but it really is a thing. Are there requirements for the nutritional value of the pet food? Like if you're just feeding pet sardines all the time, are they getting what they need? Yeah, they'd be deficient if you, so if you're just feeding sardines. So a lot of the raw companies, um, they'll, they'll all, they all should have a guaranteed analysis. Um, and when feeding raw, you're getting into the nitty gritty of feeding raw. When you feed raw, you should rotate proteins. The act of rotating proteins rotates the different um, the different uh, amino acids that they're being exposed to, and it ultimately completes their diet and makes it um, very, very healthy. Mm -hmm. And you can combine other, like uh, vegetable or whatever, even sardine products like yeah. to make it less yeah, yeah, so there's products like um, you would, like Lawrence is saying, um, you have your meat, your bone, and your organ, and then optional is your chicken veggie. shells. Glutamine. Uh, yeah. We have beans and gut for our greyhounds too. Okay. So and we cured it with that. And with the other, the yeah. interesting part versus dry food with our other grey is that he doesn't drink water at all. He, he has the moisture still in exactly. Yeah. Our other ones were just water and ham. Yeah. So it's if different. You, yeah, if you fed freeze dried and didn't rehydrate the food, they would drink just as much water. When you feed raw, your dog stops um, drinking water because all that more like seventy percent moisture. So they're getting they're consuming. Also, like on the nitty gritty, you 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 know from experience, their poo is next to nothing because their body is is taking in everything. Well, I hate to say it. So as a kid, I remember dog poos on lawn dogs. They used to go white. Right. They no longer go white mm -hmm. until our dog went on with the raw food was on, and it's it, you can see the differences. You, you know the processing that's uh, going on. Absolutely. Yeah. And it kind of you don't even have to pick it up because it just disintegrates into the lawn. So. Uh, one of the selling features, believe it or not, when I was in my retail store, I talked about the poo all the, all the time. They love it. They're like, I just leave the poo on the lawn. It just disintegrates. Don't be a parent, like, right? You gotta deal with the poo. Yeah, it's worth it's worth buying raw simply for not having to pick up the poo anymore. So, yeah. Are dogs a little bit omnivorous? Like, isn't there supposed to be a bit of a vegetable component, like in the cooked frozen food there? Like, yeah. there's some veggie in there. Do they ever? Do they sell a raw product that has vegetable they in it? They sell both, yeah. So a lot of raw companies do. It, it's called like um, veggie in, veggie out type thing. So a lot of companies make both where they have. And then companies make um, bases as well. So when you're talking about adding your own vegetables, um, there's a lot of consumers that buy the base because they have an industrial grinder. So they get the meat, bone, and organ ground up, buy that, and then they go and get their own veggies and chop it up or they have access to veggies and chop it up and add it that way. So... Yeah, you can do it either way. Um, hardcore people are, will like argue one way or the other, but realistically, like once you're at this level of feeding, it's um, it's the best you can do, basically. Um, I guess the newest newest trend is this uh, frozen fresh cook. So companies like literally within the last year and a half are starting to produce products that are fresh food, um, and then um, but cooked. And that's to negate that argument about, oh, my dog's going to get sick if I'm feeding them raw food. Well, they figure, okay, well, we're going to lightly cook it, and it, we're going to mirror the kind of the raw food where that's going, but we're going to have it cooked to negate the whole my dog's going to get sick argument. Um, so this is an interesting company out of uh, Leslieville in Toronto. Um, when you walk into their, their kitchen, it's truly a kitchen. So when you walk in, I tried to like put a picture of it here. Um, this literally open to the public. You just walk in, you literally see these guys cooking in the kitchen. Um, the oven that's behind that girl is from Germany. 
And um, where you'll find that specific model of oven is in Michelin star restaurants. <laughs> so um, that's the degree to which this company is going uh, to in, in terms of taking pet food to the next level. And the other interesting thing is, so when I talked about maybe it's more worthwhile to supply the pet food industry rather than the human food industry, um, these guys' supplier uh, is the restaurant supplier. So the restaurant supplier is dropping cuts of beef off to like these high-end restaurants, and then they stop at this place, drop the high-end cut of beef up, off there, and then continue going restaurant to restaurant to restaurant. Mm. So I mean, what that does to the cost of food, you're looking at like at a retail level, eight to thirteen dollars per pound of food. And if you had like a, a fifty pound dog, you're feeding a pound a day, so you're looking at eight dollars a day minimum to feed. But you're literally feeding them your own food. That's literally human food for dogs. But it's a dramatic difference in a pet dog, which is a private industry. Yes. So that's it's a huge saving. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that's another selling factor is if your dog's healthy, you spend less on the vet, which you can then reallocate that money to the food. Mm -hmm. and uh, so is there a growth in that sector in the pet food stores or what is carrying the buy in? Uh, yeah, uh, so what's starting to happen is um, they're starting to come out with, they're starting to add this to their freezers. Right. So it's, it's very, very new. Um, in terms, like there's not too many companies that do it. Um, and now it's starting to take shelf space in the freezer. So brand, brand new, basically. Is it moving for cats too? I'm thinking like, I have a cat and I'm told that when they get later in life, they end up having kidney failure because of lack of water mostly. Right. So if you have that raw food <coughs> and the water, the water and they're getting the water that way. Yeah, so like you were saying, they don't need to drink uh, as much <coughs> water when they're eating raw. So cats do better on raw than even dogs. So it's great for dogs, but like you can almost say like I would advocate personally that all cats should be on a raw diet um, or at least a canned diet for exactly what you're saying for the, because it's so important that they get the, the water in their diet. Yeah. yeah. But cats, so I had like, <coughs> when I was a teacher, um, one of my colleague teachers, her cat had um, diabetes um, and I finally convinced her to go on a raw food diet um, and the diabetes regressed and she no longer had to give the insulin shots. Like it literally went away. Good. So that was one of yeah. I'm like, that's so interesting. <laughs> when I saw that, I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. The vet wasn't happy because they couldn't sell <laughs> insulin anymore. <laughs> but the local birds are a little happier too. Yeah. 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 Um, so I'm going to move on now to talk about some regulations, guidelines, and certifications. Uh, this industry, unfortunately, it's, it's self-regulated, unfortunately or fortunately, depending on how you're looking at it. Uh, there's no true regulations, which means like anything goes. So when I was describing, a, I, when I described to you how companies literally start out of their basement or out of their food, the reason why that happens is because there is no regulation. So they don't need permission to literally cook something in their kitchen and take it to the store and sell it. Mm. Um, there's no kind of governing body. Uh, because you guys are from the human channel, uh, you're familiar with like the CFIA specifically, and then you'll know the counterpart FDA in the US and the EU for Europe. Uh, those regulatory bodies exist, but it's optional as to if you, like you'd have to invite the CFI into your facility mm. and say, listen, CFIA, I'd like you to <laughs> audit my facility and make sure it's all up to standard. So obviously a lot of um, companies, all the big players obviously they, they do. Um, so I'm talking more like the small to medium sized businesses. They typically, you would say they don't, but one of the trends now with the raw and fresh food is um, having CFIA come into your facility so that you can say as part of your marketing campaign, yeah. listen, food safety is important to us. So we, on our own accord, invited the CFIA into our facility. We passed their audit. Here's our proof that we passed. And they're using that to differentiate themselves, especially in raw. Because in raw, anything goes. Anybody can sell. Like you literally have people with no food safety background or anything just literally selling meat that they found somewhere somehow. Um, so the big
bigger foot like the the more legit players in the raw industry are starting to um, self-regulate themselves by meeting certain standards in mm. order to differentiate them and put them ahead of their competition. Uh, Doesn't CFI regulate the, the labeling though and the food regulations? Uh, that would be AFCO. <coughs> so, in, so on nutritional standards, AFCO is who regulates kind of what needs to be stated on the label. Um, so that's where you put your guaranteed analysis. Um, there's different nutritional standards. So I remember like even before in the pet industry, there was some kind of um, documentary on CBC um, where they do that investigation. I forget the name of the uh, marketplace. Yeah. So on marketplace, they had a dog food one. This is before I was in pet, but the person literally put a rubber, like a, a work food into the recipe, oh. round it up, because, and got the nutritional, got it to meet AFCO's nutritional standards, basically. Oh, yeah. Well, I guess we are, we are a pet food man, manufacturer, ingredient manufacturer, and I guess we have to see if I does actually look at our labeling and that. Okay. And it's just a, yeah, and it is actually a marketing strategy to actually be regulated by like a third party Right. It's mostly a bigger like Nestle's and that actually want your facility to be regulated if not they won't take it from you. Mm -hmm. So at least that's what I mean. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's the other thing, like suppliers may require that you right. have certain certifications as you point out. Yeah. yeah. So um, in terms of food safety, like because if you guys are dealing in the human chain, you're familiar with HACCP. It's, it's, it's a requirement for the human chain. Um, so if you're a pet food company, and you decide to get HACCP, which a lot of the raw food, or like numerous raw food companies have done, that changes your supply chain now, where your supply chain now has to, um, also comply with it. it has to comply with the HACCP requirements. So you start to introduce elements of traceability and certain standards there. If you don't choose to regulate yourself, then it's very open, like you can do backdoor deals type things. So like the, the meat producer, who wants to get rid of their waste, but wants to like kind of take keep it off the HACCP radar or whatever. It's kind of like a backdoor and like here's some cash type deal. So that's how some of the like, I, I don't want to say unethical, but like there's some businesses out there that like have some kind of connection and can get waste that's literally going into garbage as the HACCP plan for the facility, but they somehow acquire it. So instead of making it to the garbage can and make it to them, they turn it into food type thing. In the human uh, chain, there is a lot of effect that comes from the big players like Mob Dogs and Chili's and that sort of thing for regulatory. Is that happening in the pet industry? Yeah, so one of the trends now, um, recently in the last two years, I would say, with raw food manufacturers, there's this race to, to get HACCP certification. So three, I believe three of the raw food producers, uh, manufacturers, have achieved HACCP, one in BC and two in Ontario. They've achieved HACCP with one, there's another big one that's, I, I, she's probably there now, if not, she's like right on the brink. Oh, the Saskatoon. So when I was when I was running those companies, the, the Edmonton, um, my Edmonton facility was HACCP and so was my Saskatoon. We wanted the St. Thomas one. So I saw that as important in terms of elevating the standards. Um, in terms of selling, if you educate the consumer, you can kind of have a competitive advantage in terms of making dollars because if, if, you, if you can convince the consumer to exclude all products that aren't coming from a HACCP facility, then it's really a lot easier to, and all your products do, mm -hmm. then you win. So um, there's a lot of interesting myths in the, uh, the, uh, mm -hmm. the raw food industry, I guess. Um, in terms of coming from the supply chain side of things, like everybody's always saying human grade, human grade, human grade. Well, you, if you're any legitimate business, you're sourcing your ingredients from, like if it's seafood, for example, I'm sourcing my ingredients from one of you guys who I'm assuming is a HACCP certified facility. So by default, it's quote unquote human grade um, because it's coming from like a human <laughs> supply chain. So they're using human grade, like, I guess, loosey-goosey in terms of saying they want the consumer to believe that 
literally it's the whole fish and you're getting that whole fish from Sobeys and instead of going to your plate it's going to your dog's bowl um, when in reality they're at, you're sourcing from the same supplier but you're getting their waste products but you're calling it human grade because they're a human food chain supplier. Mm -hmm. Um, the other one, interesting one, is hormone and antibiotic free, and you see that with like cattle and things like that. Um, it would be a challenge for me to go and source from a, a meat uh, producer hormone and antibiotic riddled products because it's CFIA regulated, passive rate, like there's passive CFIA. You can't actually find uh, meat that's hormone and that's not hormone and antibiotic free because it has to comply with all the regulations. So a lot of the companies are like, oh, our meat is hormone and antibiotic free. And I'm like, of course it is. The only way it can't be is if you're some kind of really shady stuff's going on. If you're going dumpster diving or something for the pig that got like injected and thrown in the dumpster. Like, so everybody says, oh, like, yes, of course it is. The, all the meat in Canada gets like half half legit is hormone and antibiotic free. There's regulations. Yeah. It's like selling a plant product and claiming it's cholesterol free, right? <laughs> Same idea. Exactly. <laughs> no cholesterol in this plant product. Yeah. yeah. So some of the larger companies even importing products. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
the story like warm feel good in your heart like oh all these bags are getting recycled because that logo is on it but and you're the one not bringing it back but that's a big issue within the fishing industry is that they're all msc everybody's wearing the msc certification and not ocean wise because it was interesting one of the grad students in sustainable at one of the conferences said with ocean wise lobster is not a sustainable fishery because ocean wise incorporates the paid into the calculation MSC does not. The MSC lobster is uh, sustainable, but under ocean wise, it's more stringent, and it's not. So that's a big deal because most countries are going under MSC certification. Right, and that's interesting. Like you remind me of, uh, well, like you just uh, an another interesting point in, in regards to the regulations we were talking about. Like APRO is the easiest to achieve um, in terms of your standards, and there was also like. Um, there's EU standards, for example. EU standards, so if you get your food to the European Union, is actually a higher standard than AFRO. So similarly to what you're saying, just meeting the AFRO standard won't be good enough to ship your food to the EU. Mm -hmm. So that Taplo, Taplo company, they're EU certified in their facility, so they have the ability to ship to Europe. And they use that as a selling point saying, we exceed AFRO and the other standards we meet this standard, which allows us to be shipped worldwide. Champion Pet Foods would be another example. They ship worldwide, so they meet the highest standards so that they can go yeah. everywhere with their product. Um, on the marketing level, um, and in terms of ingredient trends, uh, we talked about like sustainability in terms of fish. The new thing, so like if I'm a marketer or a package designer in the pet industry, what I want to do is I want to pick icons and I'm going to, you know, flood my package with icons. So Pet Curian is a Canadian company. They make a food called Gather. That's their like highest level food, so to speak. And you'll see like it'll just have all these icons on. So some of the certifications that they chose to go after, MSC, like you just brought up and certified vegan. So they do a vegan dog food. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. Because I mean, if I'm a vegan, my dog needs to be a vegan too. <laughs> So there's a bunch of uh, trends that way. Uh, things like this company recently new to the market out of, from Italy um, called Farmina. Uh, they, they've in the last, I've seen explosive growth in the last year and a half. I, like, ironically, they're like selling features is like, look, our food has pumpkin. It's like, oh my God, pumpkin. <laughs> I need to buy it. Yeah, just like hey, I've mm -hmm. never seen a dog eat some pumpkin. No. Pumpkin <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 patches beware. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah so it, I mean, it, I kind of bringing it back to the poo. I mean, my dog has pumpkin. His poo is gonna be great, so I better <laughs> buy this food. But like realistically, they've seen an explosive, explosive growth. Italian company. Yeah, it's a solid food. food because it's coming from Italy to here, so they already mm -hmm. meet the EU standards. Yeah. So in terms of that, it's a it's a solid company. But just the marketing that's happened, so you'll see what they're doing here. It's like they want you to believe that that cut of beef is in your food. Yeah. I can tell you with certainty that cut of beef is not in your food. Unless you're paying the eight dollars a pound from that Tom and Sawyer company that we looked at, the fresh cooked food that gets their supply from the restaurant chain. Yeah. But yeah. It's all, it's all about marketing, all about like what icons can I stick, what certifications can I stick on to, you know, differentiate myself. The mm -hmm. term wild caught, like yeah. you see that a lot, like everybody in this room could say yeah. wild caught. Exactly. Um, and MFC for most of you, most of the people. Was so it Pumpkin Wild Caught? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's free range. Free range. Free range. Free range. <laughs> just highlights like the, the kind of the words and the marketing that they're doing to differentiate themselves but yeah exactly like when you're that's the funny thing that's why I get a kick out of, out of the hormone and antibiotic free because coming from like the meat when I drove to the abattoir and whatever to get my meat like it's just a joke like I know I see it. exactly yeah. Consumers are getting more and more um, aware, I guess, with the 
you're searching online and things like that. So it is getting, I guess, more and more challenging for these companies to pull the wool over the consumer's eyes. So it, yeah, like I, I can say with confidence that this wild caught concept probably in a year or two or something is going to come to light. Like what does wild caught actually mean? So there'll be a marketplace episode on it, and that'll be the end of that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, so, kind of moving along, we're getting into kind of how to enter the market. So first and foremost, um, you know, having that math background, I would look at does it actually make business sense? If you could secure a relationship with someone like Tom and Sawyer, so to speak, who's literally paying you the rest, what the restaurants are paying you, maybe there's an opportunity there. Like I would argue, if Tom and Sawyer wants to buy my fish for what I'm selling it to the restaurant for, but the restaurant wants me to fillet the fish, I'd actually rather sell it to the dog food people because yeah. now I don't have to fillet the fish, so I cut that process out, my bottom line went up, but and I'm getting the same amount of revenue for it. So you always wanna look at like if it makes business sense. Um, in terms of the pricing, uh, in my discussions with like the, the guy from Arctic Char and in line with my own experience, I used to source my, uh, there's a company called Cole Monroe, they're a trout farm. Trout, uh, <coughs> they provide trout for the human chain. They were local to me in, in St. Thomas, like literally down the street, so I would jump in the truck, drive there, get my fish racks at 10 cents a pound from them. Um, it, it's important, the, the locality is important, so they normally would just throw it out because it's not worth the 10 cents to ship it somewhere. So, but because I was local to them, I could just drive there and pick up trout racks for 10 cents a pound. So that's kind of like the pricing that we're dealing with. Um, I've heard the same thing in talking to the Arctic Char guy, like 10 to 20 cents is what the, the weight's kind of going for. So, I mean, an interesting concept is like, how can we increase that value? What can we do to increase the value to make it like more worth it to sort the waste or to make use of the waste? Um, there's, there's a lot of opportunity there. Like what we were talking about last night was like, there's lobster shells, tons of supply. What do we do to make it worth actually processing or sorting or doing something with? Um, in terms of supply, depending on who you're dealing with, you need to be able to meet um, their supply requirements. So the supply chain is critical. You don't really want to, it's, it's, I can tell you from my retail experience, it's not okay to run out of someone's dog's food. They take that personally. <laughs> so it's like, it's like not being able to feed their kid. Um, <clears throat> so I was here like not too long ago talking to Eden Valley Farms, which is a kind of a local uh, chicken producer. They're a big deal. I think they supply Costco and everybody like that. Um, and what I was looking for was like chicken hearts. And um, so we started talking about like fish over the manufacturing, quite impressive, uh, all automated and everything. Um, but the interesting point that came up is like they could give me chicken hearts but the problem was they would have to maybe invest fifty thousand dollars to adjust their process and then mm -hmm. on the quality side they need to like you know update their hassle policies all that which is quite natural uh, a large investment for them so they're looking at 50 to 100 grand and then they're like so his question to me was well i need you to take ten thousand chicken hearts uh ten thousand pounds of chicken hearts per week because mm -hmm. right now they don't sort it it goes into the bin goes to the renderer um, so there's a cost associated with sourcing it, and then you know they gotta store it, and then it's gotta get to me somehow, and I need to be able to use 10,000 pounds. And chicken uh, a week, 10, 000, uh, chicken hearts is one piece of the recipe. So there's chicken hearts and, ch and other stuff, like chicken frames and things like that. So um, you wanna align yourself with kind of someone that can use the sim similar um, volumes in terms of supply. Uh, and it, consistency, so that, that, that raw company out west, what's interesting about them is they originally sourced uh, their salmon racks from whatever local producer. They ran into this problem because um, they're big on quality and guaranteeing everything is very consistent and coming from reputable sources. They're also HACCP certified. The problem they ran into was that salmon producer was just throwing everything into a big bin and sending it to them. So they were getting like literally garbage, like people bring like, you know, garbage, garbage, like waste into that <laughs> bin and stuff. So they had to drop that supplier and move on. Luckily they found a different supplier who provided them with consistent salmon racks, like where it's just a bin of just only salmon racks. That way they know nutritionally what they're getting in the bin and they can add it to their, um, their 
in um, the recipes. And the other interesting thing that uh, with the with that I, I thought was interesting was the use of the rack. So because the meat was taken off, and you guys all know there's still a lot of meat left on the on the, the rack, I guess. But there is also enough bone there, and calcium is important in a raw diet. And so what these guys are doing is they're actually using the salmon racks to supplement the um, calcium in their red meat formulas, which I thought to be extremely interesting because I know for myself when I was producing raw food, um, grinders really, really, really don't like to grind beef bones. That's how you break your grinder. So. Whereas grinding fish bones, that's no problem. I can grind fish all day long. So I thought that was a cool, like, out of the box solution, or a, kind of a win win solution where we need calcium, but we don't want to, like, strain our machinery and wear out our machinery. Uh, we don't want to buy bone dust because it's really expensive. Hey, maybe we could go to the seafood industry, the fish industry, get the bones that they're going to throw in anyways or whatever, and use that to supplement our formula. So that was a cool use I thought that I wanted to share. Uh, lastly, moving on to opportunities. So where's the opportunities in the market? Um, it depends on like your specific situation. So in the terms of the Arctic Char guy that I'm working with, um, he seems to have basically a monopoly on Arctic Char, which is cool because then when you go to market, you can make your differentiating factor the species itself, Arctic Char for dogs. Um, it all, you also have like preferential pricing, things like that. So, I mean, if you have some kind of competitive advantage that way, how can you leverage that to make it an opportunity in the pet food industry? Uh, you gotta look at it, your waste versus primary goods. So it touches on the what I was saying earlier. Like in some business cases, or at least theoretical business case, does it make sense just to take my my um, fish or whatever my product and sell it directly to the pet food industry? maybe I can make more money or make more money because I'm processing it less. Uh, you, There's different uh, areas that you can enter, treats versus pet food. So do I want to supply the pet food chain where I can see high volumes used? So like if you have fish racks, um, that's good to go to the pet food chain because they're continuously manufacturing food, it's continuously being consumed, and you're continuously can supply it. So if I have fish racks, I can more look at using it for food, um, but there's a treat industry as well that shouldn't be ignored where like there's fish skin producers that uh, or they're using their left left cast off fish skins to make dog treats um, in terms of that fish lake road which is the arctic char company they're making they've decided they want to enter the market and produce some treats for themselves uh, to sell um, that's the avenue that they're taking because i guess they have some extra extra products do you want to be an ingredient supplier or do you want to be a manufacturer? And you got to look at like maybe it makes sense. I've seen cases before where like um, human, I've seen cases where abattoirs set up like another like side facility that produces uh, food for pets. And they do what's required in terms of like um, telling the CFIA like this is sa sectioned off appropriately. <coughs> So we have our CFIA human side, and then we have our pet room or our pet facility on the side, and they make use uh, of their waste directly uh, because then you can, they, they're not losing um, any money that way. Like they're taking something that they own anyways and turning it into a product. So you ask yourself, like, is there any opportunities there? Or do you simply want to just, you know, you take your waste and someone comes and gets it or you or like find a local company like I know there's totally raw is like one of the large local companies here so it's just about picking up the phone I can't remember her name I think it's Karen but Karen Campbell. Karen Campbell so pick up the phone call Karen Campbell and say hey Karen like I have this do you, do you need it or can you use it or can you think of a use for it because it's probably economically in your best interest if you can make a formula that uses you know my fish racks that would be good. And fish is actually sought out in the pet food industry. Um, people want to give their dogs fish, like fish treats and fish food. So Champion Pet Foods, like one of their top sellers, well, that Pacifica food actually, which ironically still it was on my slide, 
Pacifica was my number one Acana selling product in the um, in that line. So they really like people seem to have the sense that my dog needs fish every once in a while. Like they'll feed whatever, but my dog needs fish now. Like to change it up, I need to change it up with fish. Uh, <coughs> Oh, I wrote King Cold Duck up there because one of my, King Cold Duck was my duck supplier. Um, and then when I had my dehydrator, I dehydrated treats for them. So they, that they wanted to just, like as a cute add-on in their facility, because they had kind of a little setup where you could come in the front door and they had some stuff you could buy, like duck from them and stuff like that. Um, but what they also wanted was, here, here's our King Cold Duck for your dog as a dehydrated treat. So... Uh, kind of coping, coping up there. Uh, yeah, I touched on redirection to the uh, from the human chain to the pet. Basically, it all comes down to like trying to find a creative solution, similar to like that fish rack example, where maybe I can sell my rack to be used as a calcium source rather than as like a, the ingredient specifically to the dog food. So, like, what kind of creative solutions can you are there? Um, and I would suggest it's just about talking to people, talking to people in the industry, and picking up the phone and calling, um, because there are there's a ton of opportunities. There's always people with ideas, and um, it's just kind of it's all about making it work. So that's it. Any questions? Quick question about the, you're talking about the uh, pet food humanization. Mm -hmm. So you tried the. the Fishery star products. We know the big problem for the fishery of the uh, fish product is the high level of uh, the proof of omega-3 uh, fatty acid. It's very nutritious. So is that same problem uh, in terms of the sensory or nutrition? It's the same problem. That is the big, is that the big challenge when we use that bad products because I know the bad product normally is not treated as the premium spirit. We, uh, we use pure plants before, normally it's kind of slowed away, but that is going to leading the oxidation of this PUFA, that is kind of quickly deteriorated the quality or nutrition of the byproducts. Okay. From your perspective, your, your experience, is that sensory or, or nutrition is the big challenge for utilizing all this, those type of uh, specific, uh, specific byproducts? Or is that sensory that uh, it's not a big problem? It's not too big of a problem um, when you just spark an idea. One thing I didn't mention is um, on a nutritional level, the, the waste sometimes, or a lot of the times, so like the guts and stuff of the fish um, is actually nutrient rich. So it's actually, it, it, from a technically, it's better for me to include the, the guts and stuff into the food than the filet. Adding, adding the filet like seems nice from like the humanization side of things, but from a purely nutritional perspective, the guts is where they're getting their food. And if you've like seen documentaries and stuff, like, you know, the wolf kills something and then it eats its guts first, mm -hmm. right? It's highly, highly nutrient rich. Yeah, yeah. Uh, really, yeah I know. The, for example, I know the fish head is also way more nutritious than the filet, actually. They have high level of phospholipid with this omega-3 stuff. Yeah. And my question is that the back product uh, because those kind of uh, highly nutrient bioactive compounds are probably on plastic fatty acid, they're also very prone to oxidation. Yeah. Once it's oxidized, you yeah. not only lost your nutrients, but also could be leading some kind of maybe more linked to the toxicity part, toxic oh, yeah. part. So my question is that when you to develop a, a, a pet product based on the uh, bad product, is this a big challenge? So. If, you, if this is a big challenge because of the deterioration of this proof up, mm. this once you the proof oxidizes, it also leading a chain reaction to also kind of oxidize the protein and other nutrients. So is this a big challenge or or from the industry or from your experience, how the industry solve this problem to prevent the oxidation of this kind of proof of stuff to maintain the nutrients? It's a challenge because you have to add extra processes, right? Mm. So because the oxidization starts happening, like you have to do something to counter it or like with fish racks, for example, like the reason why I drove to Coleman Row is because it was freshly done that day and I could bring it back and throw it in the grinder. Um, it becomes very challenging if you have to like start shipping it and you can't, yeah, yeah. You, yeah. 
you can't leave it like just sitting there because it starts to, we were talking about last night with the lobster stuff like you have a window there the, like it starts to rot like yeah, yeah that is uh, yeah. Uh, we just got a few yeah. months before it's kind of com I'm not yeah. sure it's that common practice in fishing process plant you feel it you feel it you immediately frozen it yeah but for the bad products you leave it in there for days, two days, or three days, even longer. It depends on your capacity. Some some people may have frozen facility, but those frozen capacities using it for the more premium product, but not for the bad product. But that's where the process has to be added. That's exactly. That, yeah. Okay. That's okay. Okay. I think yeah. Bill has a lot of experience with that I mean, at IMO. <coughs> you're you're dealing with some byproducts. Yeah, Jeez. it's cost, like you're saying. You have to spend some money to say the quality of it. Right. Yeah. Leave it for three days and let it spoil, yeah. and then yeah. decide you're going to freeze it. Again. Yeah. So you have to do it. You have to have the capacity to handle it right away. Probably. Uh, Doug, we're running a little behind. Maybe yeah. three or two could save the questions. We had doing yeah. a panel session that kind of wraps everything up. So if you do have yeah. more questions, maybe just jot them down. Yeah. Maybe we can have them then. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll be able to answer yeah. questions. That's great. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Mark. We're going to take like a 15 minute break. Uh, there's some fresh coffee and everything there. We'll get a chance to talk. We'll reconvene maybe in uh, 10 to 15 minutes. Yeah. Okay.
to happen. So I'll give you a, a, a quick bio on, on our next presenter, uh, Mike Bryanton. Uh, am I pronouncing that right? So um, Michael, Michael's a research and development uh, chef. Uh, Michael is a dedicated professional with 30 years experience in all aspects of culinary and food production, including corporate chef services, restaurant management, culinary education, and, and food product development. He is a certified research chef and consumer and sensory science expert, including years of international experience with a strong focus on product quality and profitability. Michael's diverse professional history includes the past 17 years as a senior team member of Canada's Smartest Kitchen and as a culinary arts instructor with the Culinary Institute of Canada, specializing in food century client experiences as well as instructing in culinary trends, international cuisine programming, and culinary demonstration setup and delivery. He's also, he also has 10 years prior experience as, a, as an executive chef and restaurant owner, including event planning and catering management, directing food preparation and, and schedule event training. Um, some of the highlights of this culinary experience, certified research chef, uh, research chef association 2015, Duke and Duchess of Cambridge Royal Visit Culinary Team PEI 2011, uh, selected to train and instruct culinary and tourism students in China, uh, coach of junior culinary teams in successful local, national, and international level, successful restaurant openings and culinary execution in Canada, U.S., and the Caribbean. So uh, I'd like to welcome Mike Bryant to Then the trick is to commercialize that. How can we get that to uh, scale up and, and make it 
similar or the same as the uh, gold standard. The food science piece, um, that's more of the regulatory part and the food safety. We want to make sure that the food is you know, meeting, uh, is complying with, with regulations. And then the business expertise. So there's a lot of companies that will do individual pieces of this. We try to, we don't like to call it a one-stop shop, but we, that's what we try to be. We try to link all those other connections seamless to our client. And the business expertise is part of that is the marketing of the product, getting it uh, in front of brokers, getting it on the retail shelf. Um, so we try to uh, take care of that for all of them. Um, we act as a part of your team, so a lot of our clients get uh, very involved in the product development. Some just want to be hands off, let us do all the work, and then hand them the package. Um, I'll skip the rest of it because it's going to come up in our in our action smart process. Um, part of uh, what we developed over the years is uh, this ecosystem, um, so it's a food product development ecosystem. There's a lot of different uh, parts that are required, uh, especially in the Maritimes. One of our, if I look uh, here, one of our main, uh, one of the main acts we get, uh, which is pretty unique to Canada and then east of Canada, especially uh, versus like our U.S. clients or European clients. Funding, and that's where COA comes in in many cases. But there's also federal sources of funding and, and provincial sources of funding. Um, we have very good relationships with all the funding partners. We also have, because we're um, part of Palm College and Education Institute, we have uh, access to federal funding that a private entity wouldn't have. So when you come through our door, that's often a discussion that's had in, in the initial phases. Can we get some matching dollars from the Office of your costs of, of production? The um, partnerships, partnership is we know what we know, we know what we don't know, and if we don't know it, we're going to find somebody who does. And again, we try to make that seamless. We don't want the client having to jump around from place to place. Uh, so we'll work with companies like BioFoodTech and Shell uh, who will often do some analytical work for us. We'll do shelf life testing. Uh, we'll send things to RPC. We'll work with other companies uh, in marketing or packaging. Uh, we uh, have good partnerships. Food chains in Europe that are uh, food atelier in Europe that are you know, specialized in packaging. A lot of that packaging happens in Europe far before it happens in Canada. It's like that West Coast to East Coast, East Coast trend only from Europe to North America trend. The uh, market access um, we we built a network uh, also over the years of brokers, um, people who are in the in the business of getting the product onto the shelf. We work with a lot of uh, ex law laws people, people uh, with Sobeys, with Wayne Reed, uh, some of the bigger places in the U.S. as well. So the idea is to get you guys into the uh, into the shelf. I think it's probably one of the, the hardest one of the hardest things with food product development is you can get a great concept, you have everything down the packaging, the the, the the brand, everything is looking good. Then the next step is to get a hundred thousand units on the shelf somewhere. You know, that's where often the funding stops before that, and then that the bridging that gap is the hard part. Whether you're finding a co-processor to do your product, whether you're going to invest in capital for equipment, that's what they offer. After that, we try to help out with that. So we have a number of partners that, that can make those things a bit easier. Uh, suppliers. Now, the, this is kind of a food centric discussion. Um, but as Mark said, there's a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, overlap between food suppliers for the human system and pet food suppliers. Uh, so we have also good relationships with, with the uh, suppliers who are going to be able to, uh, depending on your volume, some suppliers will not look at you for not buying uh, you know, one ton at a time or more. And then there's some that will work with you if you're, if you're looking for large volumes. We've identified them, we work with them fairly closely and uh, decide who's the best fit for your particular product. So that wouldn't uh, differ very much uh, from human food and pet food. 
even the packaging, because the packaging that is uh, canned, retorted product when it's in fresh frozen, it's all unwrapped and spiky. And the infrastructure expertise, so that's kind of all So our smart process uh, starts with a, the business review. So this should be sort of an internal thing if you're if you're not looking for third-party uh, food product development, but this should be a uh, piece of your food product development regardless. So when it says business review, what are your capabilities? What is your uh, access to supply uh, of product? Um, what is your internal supply of product? Do you have a byproduct? How you use it, and then uh, are you able to utilize that, or is that something you want to sell as, a, as an ingredient as opposed to a finished product? The, um, so we would bring someone in, um, look at their business, look at their capabilities. Typically, uh, when feasible, we'll also do a site visit to see what the uh, process and capabilities are, what the byproducts are. We'll evaluate that uh, before we do anything else. So there's no sense in doing product development on a product that's not, they're not capable of producing, or they don't have the volume of product to, to make it feasible as a product. Um, funding uh, requirements, um, again, we will determine if the client needs funding or is self-funding, or if it's going to be a combination of the two. Uh, you'll find if, you, if you've never done product development before and you're trying to get into it, there are some really good sources of funding that, uh, especially in the startup phase, where um, you can get some pretty significant matching dollars uh, that's from funding sources that are not, there's no uh, dollar or any kind required. So that's, those are usually a good introductory uh, way to get in to a little bit of development. And then the larger scale ones, we, we've got uh, uh, funding that will go up to three years. Really, it's a scalable uh, of funding. And then, food service is, is, is an outlet that a lot of people don't think about in the early stages. So, if you have a product, um, is it going to be on a retail shelf? Do you have retail package, single unit or, or multi unit? Or are you going to bulk package it and, and sell the food service? That's often a better uh, outlet for your product if there's less marketing required, you're already going to have a sales team with this building and your DFS and things like that, they're probably going to be in that uh, sense trying to move your product for you. Um, but private labels and other options, um, and I suspect in the pet food industry there'll be at some point private labels uh, where you have a, a single facility producing out of a number of different brands. Uh, and not the Mars uh, of the world, not there, so the Nestle will go there, where they own all the brands but they produce it by The next part, so we've seen your business, we're looking at how, uh, how you run, what your capabilities are, then we have to go to our market assessment phase, so, and if you're going to do your own in-house R&D, you'd want to do the same thing. You don't create a product that there's no market for, so we have to go to the market, and we have a number of ways of doing that, internet's a great resource, obviously, uh, talking to industry professionals, uh, category managers uh, in supermarkets are, are quite a good resource, they'll tell you what's selling well, but they'll also tell you what, what's being asked for that's not that's not available yet. So if you're looking for a new market product, they'll, they'll say, well, we get a lot of requests for this type of product, or that type of product, or this kind of a package. Uh, so uh, there's also trend reports, and there's uh, a number of industry papers that you can rely on for, uh, is it a growing segment, or is it a declining segment? Um, so uh, consumer trends, that one's a dicey one because it, it, a lot of people want to be hitting a trend. Uh, the trend, trend basically has a 10 year cycle. You want to be hitting it at the right time of that 10 year cycle. Sometimes the trend is uh, not sustainable, so you might invest a lot of money getting into this trend, uh, and then it just drops off, and then you draw out the product and you, you, you can miss the mark on that. Other trends will become more sustainable with it, uh, omega-3s, things like that, and you're, where you hear nothing about them, 
you know, you, you will see this growth of omega threes in the market. You know, it's not been sustained over over time. So people who invested in that trend early on are still doing well. Um, when I thought culinary, uh, how to identify trends? There was two places where I always told my students to go. If you want to know what's going to be trending in restaurants, so basically the uh, the trend will start at uh, in food. It'll start at fine dining restaurants, and then we'll just talk about on blogs and things like that, starting to get written about, written about in, in uh, publications. And then it becomes more, you know, it gets to mom and pop type restaurants, then PSRs, and, and then ultimately in retail. Um, where I used to tell my students to go look to see what's on trend, there are two places. Pet food is actually one of them. Pet food, you'll notice anything that's on trend in the food industry, you'll see it in the pet food. And then you show another graphic there of those labels that go on packaging, uh, the omegas, the omegas, the, the antioxidants, and the blueberries, and pumpkin, things like that. Those are all two or three trends. Uh, the other one was in the cosmetic aisle of the supermarket. If you've ever gone down the cosmetic aisle where the shampoos and all that other stuff is, you'll see all the same ingredients, all the same sort of buzzwords being used. Uh, so you're going to see uh, certain oils, and certain, uh, again, omega-3s, whether they're helpful to your hair or not, I don't know. Uh, so you're going to see all those same things in that aisle as well. So there's a number of places to find out where the trends are, what, what is on trend. Uh, we'll do a competitive product analysis. Um, so if a product is, is already out there, what is that, what kind of uh, effect are they having on the category? Is it a billion dollar uh, sort of uh, category or is it you know, a couple million dollar category? You have to know what you're getting into, who you're competing with. Uh, we've had clients who wanted to get into the frozen pizza business. And I don't recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't recommend it. There's so much competition in that in that category that uh, and, and you, know, you can go to the supermarket any time and buy a frozen uh, pizza for three dollars. Geez, that's a tough business to be in. And to get the sort of marketing power to get that on the shelf so you give people a reason to buy yours instead of the one next to it that's half the same half the price, it's hard to do unless you have something really unique about your product. Then it comes to consumer education piece, and that's always difficult to foster as well. So there are certain categories that we don't tell a client not to do it. We just give reasons why they shouldn't, and let them make the decision. So the uh, and then the validating the validating concept. So often, what we'll do before we start any product development piece is we do some focus groups, or uh, do consumer surveys, things like that. So we think about the product. We'll put it uh, the concept in front of uh, product managers or category managers in the, in the supermarkets that says, hey, they're going to tell us whether or not uh, we should move forward with that project. Uh, the accelerated concept. Um, so normally as a team, when we bring a new project in, uh, depending on the size of it, we'll normally work on the initial phases as a team. We'll bring the whole group around the, uh, around the table. There's 11 of us currently, and we'll uh, basically just talk about the product, throw, throw everything out of the, you know, the wall, as they say, uh, and then kind of narrow it down. So you might start out with, with 30 or 40 different ideas or concepts, and then start to narrow that down into ones that are uh, perhaps more feasible than others. Uh, but that's where the, sometimes the client will come in, they already have their idea, they already have their concept. They just won't commercialize it. But other times it's, they may have an ingredient. And what can we do with this ingredient? So we'll battery test the ingredients. We'll come up with ideas of how to utilize that ingredient, uh, which can also be helpful. So not everyone wants to be a product developer or do a value add. They just want to sell generic stuff. Um, refine the product definition. So, okay, what is the product actually? We have a concept, but what is the actual product? Is it Shelf stable product is a refrigerator frozen product. Is it a uh, single unit or is it bulk? 
with all the things that we do. We do a product brief, it's called, and we'll define what that actual product is and what it's going to mean to the consumer. Uh, looking at the regulatory, again, we don't want to develop products that aren't going to be either unsafe or not fit within the Canadian or international regulatory uh, parameters. So we will look at the regulatory before we do certain ingredients, how we use those ingredients, keeping what amounts to use these ingredients. Uh, there's a lot of ingredients out there that you'll see from each and mom's off the shelf, but you can't use them in a food process. Or if you do use them in a food process, you only use it in one category of food products, and you want to use it at some level. So we have to look at all those things as well. Uh, packaging issues, what's the label going to look like? Um, as opposed to the pet food industry, the front of the label is very strictly regulated in Canada. Uh, some of those images you saw in the pet food versus meat and, and, and pumpkin and things like that. That's not allowed to appear on a consumer product. It's a lot of things. Mm. You, you can't even suggest that it's going to get flagged up. So we have to look at all those things. So we do that in the uh, piece as well. And that process requirements. That could mean that the company's going to need to purchase new equipment or uh, invest in a facility, or they're going to outsource that. Uh, at least in the, one of the good options is to find a co processor. Uh, and there have been some seminars going on. Um, you know what's name Peter? Uh, Learn Spirit. Yeah. Le Learn Spirit. Yeah. So there, there's one coming up in Halifax in March. Um, whether you want to be a co-processor or whether you're looking for a co-processor, you kind of have two different uh, streams that you can go to. So it's a really good resource as well to find out who's out there who's capable and willing to process food. It's a real good intermediate step because you're not investing a ton of money in you know, software equipment. You just kind of generate some product, generate some revenue uh, to justify whether or not to make that move to your own facility. Uh, so, and then the, the bench top formulation, that's really where the the lifting begins. We will take the formulation and we'll we'll do it at a kitchen scale. Now, so we do have a commercial kitchen, but we also do it. Um, you want to get the recipe as such that it's 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 the goods where you want it to be, uh, but also keep in mind that you know the cost of the ingredients, the available the ingredients, uh, what kind of processing is going to be involved when you actually go up the scale. So a number of the pieces of equipment we use are, uh, you know, we have two, diff two independent sets of pliers. One's a penny penny, one's a ply master. Uh, the reason being is you know, take French fries and fry at 360 degrees and cook the food. Uh, Wendy's uses the henny penny fryer. So if we're working on Wendy's products, that's what we validate all our products with. It's very thin McDonald's, most of the rest use the fry master. We use that for validating products. We have bench scale uh, equipment, so uh, extruders, the heat edge, the heat edge, the uh, carbonators, uh, large scale drying and smoking uh, equipment, uh, chambers for uh, food light, uh, food shelf light uh, evaluation. They're all miniaturized, but they are scalable. So we, we, we try to keep the scalability in mind every time we develop a product, uh, as you should. Um, because if you can't go from 10 bench top units to 250,000 production units, then, then there's the gap that you're not going to be able to break. Uh, so we'll actually work with companies as well on that scale up part. We'll take that from there. Right we're done. We'll go and work with the uh, scale up and you know, running snags and reasons why it's not working. Um, to give you an idea of what like a lot of uh, food product development is the reformulation just add, adding a change in the ingredient or supplier. And uh, give you an idea how sensitive that can be, how uh, one of our broker principals for he, he was with Wawbox. You know that uh, uh, decadent chocolate chip cookie? Cookie mm -hmm. That was their first private label SKU. And uh, it became so popular so fast. They're producing in Ontario. It became so popular so fast that they decided they would, uh, for distribution purposes, open up a, a mirror facility in Alberta. So when they did that, they built it the exact same spec, exact same equipment, everything was identical. Um, they started producing the cookies there, but it wasn't working. 
Mm -hmm. Actually, like, the snow day. So he was identical. Except for one thing. The flower in Ontario was was coming from Alberta. The flower in Ontario was coming from Ontario. So there was about a half percent difference in protein. Mm -hmm. You know, one little thing causes that to reformulate the entire cooking work with the Alberta flower. Mm -hmm. So <coughs> that could happen in scale. So that could happen in ingredient changes. Every time you see a new trend like low sodium, no sugar, or things like that, there's a ripple effect all the way down the line. You can't just take sugar out of the product and substitute with a, with a, like an artificial sugar or a stevia or something like that. You can't just do that and expect the same results. There's bulking in the sugar, there's other, you know, the way sugar is delivered, the time and the, the palate and that sort of thing. Uh, low fat products, low sodium products. Uh, there's some companies that would change the sodium level of a product and Again, it wouldn't work on their equipment. So, scale is a big piece. Um, and developing the, the product from the start to address that is also a big piece. Uh, sensory analysis. So, we run our product. Um, how do we determine whether it's, whether it's good or whether it's ready? If you're trying to do a product match, is it the same as your own previous product or as a competitor product, we do that through sensory analysis. So uh, if I want to do a product match, we do what we call a triangle test. We compare a uh, you know, sort of a client product versus a second client product or versus a national brand product. And then is it the same? A lot of times it comes down to, you know, uh, Wendy's wants to change their onion ring. Well, they want to change their onion ring supplier, for instance. If you want that business, you gotta show them that you've created their onion ring, recreated their onion ring, and no one's gonna know the difference. So that's where a triangle uh, test would come in. Uh, they have to do it with a third party, or let's say the standard firm. They would have to use a third party um, validation that they've matched the product, and then whatever else is included when you insert is gonna wanna keep the price or general availability that sort of thing as well. Um, so we do that through sensory analysis. We also determine product liking. So consumer panels, bring them in, do you like the product? We got this product, a lot of our clients are coming with their product and want to commercialize it. They're really married to the product. They, they love it, they think it's the best. They, the, the salsa they served at Super Bowl Sunday and all their buddies told them it's the best thing on the planet. So, what Sensory will tell us is that we can bring in consumer panels and have them evaluate it. And there's times where we have to break the news to the client, no, it's, it's not great. So I, I, sorry to interrupt, but how would you do that with a uh, test room? Is Green Dog safe? Yeah. Well, I've been around with everybody trying. Just, <laughs> just, just, <laughs> just like product development as a whole is, yeah. uh, is uh, there's a lot of uh, similarities. It's the same in the sensory field. So there are literally human testers right. in, in the pet food industry. There's not a lot of documentation in sensory evaluation in the pet food industry. Right. There's um, a lot of what's out there is proprietary because the Fury guys and all the other guys are doing it. They're not sharing the results. Mm. Um, but there are ways of doing it. Um, so but there's, let's say, consumer liking for the pet. There's a couple of different ways. You can take a single bowl, fill it with your product, put it in front of X number of dogs or over X number of days. How much are they eating? How fast are they eating it? That tells you whether they like it or not to some extent. Or they're just really hungry. Yeah. So that, so that uh, becomes a bit of a, uh, a statistical, there's some statistical error there. Yeah. Just one, add one point. Actually, I have this question before. How the dog is going to how are you going to deter determine the dog's like it or not? I actually we tested some of uh, pet food before, but it's, we're not tested for, for sure. Mm -hmm. But uh, I know there's a, they add some fish oil into the pet food, but one indicator for, for as a human to test the quantity of the pet food is just the, to smell the, the pet food to see whether you can uh, detect some of the fish smells. Mm -hmm. If you get those strong off flavor from the fish oil, yeah, that is kind of indirect for the quantity of pet food. That is the one way we determine the pet food uh, quantity. Mm -hmm. But one of the issues of using a human as the 
instrument is the price among which my experiment off is the animal going to have that same perception of that. So then it becomes a more of a preference test. So instead of one bowl, use two. One theta, one on theta. Which one are they going to do first? How much of this do they eat? How long is it taking you? Then you have a direct comparison of preference. Mm -hmm. uh, did you have a question on that? Yeah, when you said human testers, were you talking about human food or are there human testers to There's human testers sensory for sensory on animals? Animal food as well. Okay. Um, I, just, I wasn't clear on that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll describe the last sort of preference test, but then I'll get the, okay, the, okay. How, how it's, it's more correlated test. Yeah, I wasn't sure. So the, 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 the another way they do testing, um, and Kansas State University does a fair amount of animal testing. Um, they'll do a what they call rank order preference test. Mm. So they'll take five little clay toys basically, and they'll they'll uh, put a different ingredient in there. In, in, in many cases, it's just different types of meats. And they'll put the meats in. They kind of train the dogs. So they train them on the aroma. Dog, dogs have a much better sense of smell than we do. Cats have a less uh, sense of smell than we do, so they get the message from dogs and cats. Uh, cats can't taste sweetness or carbohydrates, for instance, so there's a different way to do testing with them uh, versus dogs. Um, but what they'll do is they'll train the dogs on the scent of those five samples, for instance, and then they will uh, bring them into the lab and see which one they go to first, which they eat first, and whether they eat them all or not. Then the dog has to re repeat that. And so it's repeating, 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 and then they get some sort of correlation. How many times do you know this one first, this one second, and that's mm -hmm. how they determine sort of rank order preference using, using dogs. So <coughs> interestingly, in the, in the tests that um, Kent uh, State did, the dogs were adverse to raw food. They're doing raw, just solid raw meats, just a whole bunch of meats. Um, the first run through, and they did this in three sessions, so they did a raw meat, a cooked meat, raw meat, uh, with all the dogs. And then everybody gave a lecture on how cross species that there's different, different differences in preference. But they did, um, the first round that they did, uh, a number of dogs wouldn't even finish the test, so they were kind of like, we might try two of the raw pieces. The second round was we cooked all the dogs, the majority of the dogs completed the test. And then when they reintroduced the raw food, the majority of the dogs finished that. Mm. Just on an initial test, on initial uh, exposure to the raw food, the dogs were uh, kind of reversed. Mm. Um, yeah. 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 The consumer sees that too from the pet food, like from a retailer standpoint. Mm. Customers okay. coming back and saying my dog didn't like it. Okay. Or, I can remove the yeah, yeah. 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 It's interesting though. Yeah. But and, and but the, based on the studies they can be conditioned to like it and they they, they, they uh, open range to like it. They also um, the the repetition is the, is the big thing to show show over time the dog will make the same choices again and again. Uh, these are all in sort of liking pets. What the dog like. And when the humans get involved, there's, there's a number of ways to sort of make product development easier for the pet food manufacturers. Uh, one is um, because humans are good descriptive panelists, or can be a good descriptive panelist. You can describe, okay, the dog we already know likes product A. So let's try, let's put product B in front of some consumers. Are the smells similar? Are the textures similar? How do they feel in the hand or whatever? They can do that a little bit of correlation that way, saying, well, we know dogs kind of like this texture, we know dogs kind of like this aroma. That's a good starting point to continue with. Um, there's other methods, so the, there's texturizers, uh, texture measuring instruments, there's uh, what they call a product tongue, a product nose, uh, mass spec. You can use all those to kind of facilitate uh, product development. They already have certain data that is shown that pets like to some extent. Let's start there and, and, and use that. Have you asked to get humans to taste the product, or is that off the limit? No, it's not off the limit. Um, we haven't done it. We, we're, getting, we're getting a fair amount of requests for pet food development these days. We haven't done human uh, taste testing. Um, 
But the point is, it may not give you very useful information because we do not take case limit dogs. Right, again, unless it's a correlated figure, mm -hmm. yeah. you're talking about exactly. Dogs. I mean, mm -hmm. not a lot of value to the yeah. case limit dogs. Yeah. Um, but smell is such an important part of taste. Yeah. 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 Especially for dogs. Yeah. 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 So, no, we would we think we typically use that in the body of the uh, our board, our ethics board, when we have for the bite, yeah. say, for the feet. <laughs> sure, good yeah. point. Clearly, we would have to <laughs> permission to and sign off. That's what we're having for lunch. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't look like nothing. Yeah. 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 Um, so, so, yeah, we would use a sense of evaluation at every, at every step. So, whether it's talk match or whether it's uh, likability. There's also a focus group that you can do, and, and uh, we do mostly central location testing, so we bring people in. Uh, another thing with pets is um, familiarity <coughs> and trust. So they may eat that raw food if a parent is giving it to them mm. more readily than they would if it's in a controlled lab situation. Yep. So there is a, a trust on, on both sides. Probably the one for pets, um, and I said it was similar to for human product development, be more similar when we're doing products specifically for children. Because you have two entities there. Kids gotta like it, but the parents gotta like it. Mm. And a lot of the aroma and stuff like that that you get in, in pet foods, that's for the community collection. The packaging for all that sort of stuff. It's not because it's a lot of packaging. Mm. So all, all that is you gotta make the community <coughs> first, the then, then the yeah. dog. But the dog isn't gonna keep eating it if it doesn't like it. That's right. So you have to satisfy both. The other similarity, obviously, with dogs is tongue speak. I mean, kids often are verbally challenged when it comes to descriptive factors and foods. So we use similar methodologies with children as you do with, with pets in terms of presentation. Uh, the difference with kids is often we use a methodology scale and use smiley faces versus uh, numeric scales. Mm -hmm. uh, so we conduct sensory analysis, and then through that sensory analysis, often we find when we can make some changes when product optimization comes in. Um, one of the ways we do that is uh, what's called the JAR scale. So uh, we can get a consumer likability. Um, that gives us a general liking. We don't know specifically what they like or dislike about it, because uh, consumers aren't great at descriptive things. You might have uh, 60 panelists in a, in a room, and 20 of them might say something is too sweet, and 20 of them might say it's not sweet enough, mm -hmm. but they both like it. Mm -hmm. So uh, we don't really know why they like or dislike it <laughs> for the most part. So then you can use uh, things like a jar test to really specifically focus on certain attributes. So if it's salt, I have a five point scale. In the middle of that scale is a jar, which is just about right. Over to the right of the scale is a little too much, far too much. Or the left of the scale is not quite enough, not nearly enough. So you're only focusing on one aspect, and then you bring in 60 people, 100 people, get those numbers, and then find out that can pretty much tell you do you have too much salt, do you have not enough salt, or is the salt just about right? Uh, so we've optimized the product based on that, then we do the food science, we send it for uh, micro testing, we do uh, shelf life testing, uh, you'll see shelf, you know, there's best before data on it, every product out there. Um, most people think that's mandatory, it's, it's not. Uh, it's mandatory in, I think it's 70 days or less refrigerated. So it is, it's mandatory, but canned goods, things like that, dry goods, shelf stable goods, it's there because the uh, producers chose to put it there, not because not they're mandated to. <laughs> but just in terms of knowing your product, being able to estimate your supply chain and things like that, uh, shelf life testing is. We can do uh, a real life testing, or you can do, in some cases, a protocol for accelerated testing. So you can take a chamber, put the product in the chamber, bring the temperature up to 37 degrees or 38 degrees, whatever, and then there's a correlation between how quickly it goes at that temperature versus ambient supermarket temperature. Um, then we go to scale. So there's different ways to go to scale. One is to do, uh, to go straight in your own facility. Uh, another, and one we use uh, Plasmatech quite a bit for, 
what we use some other companies for, you know, sort of an intermediate scale. Typically, it's a very expensive way to do things. You're not going to make much money off that first run, but <coughs> because we're not, we're uh, we're an inspected facility, but we're not good fire inspection facility. So we technically can't make the products for intermediate sale. Or there's certain circumstances where we can make products for humans to send out for market testing, uh, but typically we like to do that in a fire facility. So so we need a bias inspection. It's expensive, but it gets you out there. It gets your uh, market data that you want. Uh, then you can go to a real co-processor or to a full-size facility of your own. You make those determin uh, determinations along the way, but that's the first market test. Um, even the big companies, the universal company that does, uh, they got 300 cans of a product made. Facilities in the Jamaican market, 300 for the Trinidadian market. And they did that at one of those intermediate scale sites to just get the feedback. After the feedback, they do 20 million at a time. So it's a pretty <coughs> big difference to the intermediate scale. Uh, marketing sale distribution plan again. Uh, a lot of companies, their companies already have this stuff in place. They have their marketing, they have their brand, their logo, they have everything in there. If not, then that's part of what we offer or what you have to keep in mind. Regardless, is it a brand new product? Is there a consumer education piece? Is it a Me Too product? Or, or is it going to be even a bigger focus group? We've had clients who come in with a product and where they thought the product might work might be entirely different. Not that the product's not ready for market, but uh, we've had clients, uh, we've had focus groups tell us, I would never expect to see that in this position in the supermarket. I would expect to see it here. And that can change how you market things as well. Uh, seafood's a tough one to market because the numbers show, the last numbers I heard anyway, only about 8% of shoppers spend any significant time in the seafood department. Uh, so if you can get your product in more than one place in the store, it's a little more expensive as far as access to space, but uh, you're going to get a lot more eyes on it. Or <coughs> it's going to have to stand out some other way. And really uh, maximize uh, how you're getting those those eight percent from having to get more eyes on your product. And I suspect that that group probably would feel similar. I, I know I don't go down the pet food aisle at the Loblaws, so I don't get dogs and I don't have cats. But I, I guess if there's 60, 20, 60 percent of people own pets, I'm probably getting some pretty good numbers down those aisles. Um, then the launch supply. Hopefully, at the end of all this, risk has been mitigated. You validated your concepts. You've gone to production. Then it's a product launch. That's still other than keeping it on the shelf after it's launched. So a lot of products will certainly launch, but then a year later they disappear. You wonder why you can't find them anymore. So that's the market making those decisions. And uh, that's done for. So again, we're, we're going to be able to ask some questions of everybody on the on the panel there uh, afterwards. So um, we'll just uh, we're going to. Oh, yeah.
So as as Peter said, up, I'll just do a, a quick bio on on Peter. Uh, what we'll probably do is uh, is do do his session, and we'll take a little break before the before the panel uh, discussion, and then let it be served after that, so we'll be able to do uh, networking and stuff at that point. So um, Peter, who's standing right here. Uh, uh, Peter understands the Canadian uh, food industry. Peter is committed to helping you understand consumers and customers. Uh, Peter has considerable expertise from developing products, building uh, relationships with suppliers throughout the supply chain to retail merchandising. Uh, Peter has worked for 19 years with Canada's largest food retailer, Loblaws. After leaving Loblaw, he started <coughs> Ski Food uh, to help producers like yeah, yeah, yeah. Food, uh, to help producers and processors understand retailers better and sell more, um, which we all like to sell more stuff. Um, he is also the author of uh, A la carte, A Supplier's Guide to Retailer Priorities. Um, Peter has provided retail insights into the Globe and Mail, the Toronto Star, Canada AM, McLean's Magazine, and he writes a monthly column in the Grove. Peter is here to help you get more of your products into more shopping carts more often. And I think that timing is pretty good. I that. hope so. Yeah. Peter would like to see his PowerPoint on the screen before he starts talking. There we go. <coughs> okay, perfect. So i got to get one thing before I start. to speak, I bring my shopping cart with me. And the reason I bring my shopping cart with me is it's a subliminal message. I want you to remember <coughs> through all this stuff that if you don't get the products that you're working on and producing into the shopping cart, it's all for naught. You know, we can get so jazzed up about product development and you heard Mark talk about the market, you heard Michael talk about the development process, but then they're going to bring the guy from Loblaw in to tell you that only about one in ten works. <laughs> so, so the reality is, you know, you've got to get your products into that shopping cart to be successful in this racket. So I'm going to leave it here. When you look up at the screen, you'll see it. And just always remember that if it doesn't get in the shopping cart, that it's not going to work for you. And I had a brilliant opening schedule for this morning. And you ruined it. No. <laughs> <laughs> I have a Greyhound, but I don't make her food. Uh. And on the, at the back, there's Stella. So Stella's our greyhound, who's five and a half now. And uh, I'm at the back having remorse because I'm not home cooking her food for her. So I forgot my whole opening because of that. <laughs> so that's Stella. But I am a consumer in this market. So if you're working on some stuff that uh, might be of interest to us, and all the things that Mark talked about, you know, about being part of the family and all that, it's definitely true uh, in our household. We bought that sectional couch for her at Costco, and uh, <laughs> we spend more on dog couch than we do on people couch. So. Um, and another thing, when you were talking about testing pet food, I, I, I actually recall back a story. So I did spend tw about 20 years with La La, and when you work on the merchandising side in La La, you kind of have a bit of an attitude. I don't know, has anybody here dealt with La La? Yeah? Are, are you familiar with that attitude? Yeah? Thank you. We were talking about poop, well yours doesn't stink if you work on the merch side of Lava, okay? So, a number of years ago, back when we could do things with suppliers, Barber Foods used to have a fishing camp up in the Miramichi. And it was a treat to allow some of the people, and usually it was us on the merch side who got to go because we dealt with the vendors and we were obviously the most important people in the business. And then word came from above, things were starting to change, you need to expand this, you need to bring some people from different parts of the business on some of these, you know, sort of nice things that you get to do sometimes. So we had a person from finance with us on the trip, <coughs> and also a guy from IT. Does anybody here work in IT? No? Sort of? Okay. You might not want to, if you want to go, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So this was just when the pepperoni treats were coming out. So our pet food category manager was with us, and he brought a bag of the pepperoni treats with him. 
The IT guy thought it was from the deli department. <laughs> <laughs> After half a bag, we had to say, stop. Like, you got to stop eating that stuff. But anyway, that was our version of pet food testing in the grocery world. So I think they listed it. And anyway. So this industry that we're talking about, and my background is food. Um, I didn't work on the specialty pet side like Mark. We did some great information this morning about that. Um, but I'm going to talk to you about the marketplace, and it's changing so fast. I mean, this market that you are trying to get into if you develop a, a product for the pet category, it's changing as fast as the consumer market is changing. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, when I, uh, when I think about how this, what has to happen here, one of the things for me is that, you know, success in this racket, it's, it's not about making great products to sell. It's about selling those great products you make. I'll say it again. It's not about making great products to sell. It's about selling the great products you make. And so often, people come to me and they've got this unbelievable product and all this kind of stuff. And you heard Michael talk about it as well. But if they don't have the ability and the expertise and the resources required to sell that product into the market, it's not going to work. It is never going to get into that shopping cart because you have to put those efforts into it. When I worked at Lava, Dick Curry was the president of the business at the time, and he used to tell us that success in the grocery industry is 5% strategy and 95% execution. And you have to include selling in that 95%. That is not a strategy anymore. This is part of what you have to go out to do to be successful in it. So, how many people here have been to Disney? So probably like half maybe more than half of the room. So for those of you who've been there, would you agree Disney are great at selling the great product they make? <coughs> They're the masters of, you come off the ride, you're in the shop, whatever, right? So a few years ago, we took our family to Disney. This is my daughter, Grace. So in the morning, Grace gets up and we're going to the Magic Kingdom and Grace is like, Daddy, Daddy, we've got to go to, I want to be on Space Mountain. And I'm like, oh, great. <laughs> I hate those things. <laughs> you ever see somebody who put together a roller coaster? <laughs> you think they really got them all tightened just the way they're supposed to be tightened, all those nuts and bolts on that quarter that you're going around at whatever miles an hour? Anyway, but you take your kids to Disney, you got to do it, you're, you're all in, right? So I'm like, oh, good, Grace, you know, that's great, let's go, you know, we'll, I'll take you on Space Mountain. So you can see she was wound up. So we get in the line and you're going through the line and you, they have long lines of Disney. But so we get to the front and Grace is just vibrating. She's just like wound tight. And I'm like, take it easy Grace, calm down. She's just bouncing. She's bumping into people and she's bumping off the stanchions. And I'm like, take it easy. You're gonna like wipe out the whole line here. They got guns here, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I look at her and I said, are you all right? Are you gonna go on the ride? And she looks back at me and she goes, Daddy, I'm X scared. <laughs> I said, you're what? I'm X scared. I'm excited and scared all at the same time. <laughs> so for me, that's what you need to be if you're going to get into this racket. You need to be excited. You've got to be excited. You've got to be wound up with the products you're working on and how you're going to bring it to market. But you should also be scared, scared to death because you're going to have to invest a lot of money. You're gonna have to be told a whole bunch of times it doesn't work, or it's not good, or it doesn't, you know, doesn't do what it's supposed to do. And part of that's negotiating. <laughs> I can tell you from my experience. So you've got to be X scared about what you're gonna get into here because uh, it's it's a balance, right? Mm -hmm. So, and you're gonna hear me talk a lot today about consumers and customers. Consumers are the people who are gonna buy these products in the store. So that's me going into whatever store to buy that product for my Greyhound. The customer is the retailer who buys it from you. And it's very important that when you're going through this process of trying to develop products and bring them to market, that you think of both of these two groups because they both have needs. Some of those needs intersect, there's no doubt about that, but there's consumer needs that are unique, like you were talking about, you know, does the dog like it or not? As a category manager looking after departments at Lava, I really didn't care. I just wanted to sell. You know, I don't care if your dog loves the taste of it or loves the smell of the chicken or whatever it is that you're putting in there, chicken hearts or whatever you got going on there. Um, so it's, you know, they, the consumers have needs, 
customers have needs and some of them intersect. So as you're going through the process, make sure that you're focused on both. The only products that ever have a chance of success are the ones who address needs of both groups. You cannot just develop a product that consumers love. If you do, it will not work. Well, I can tell you right now. I've seen lots of great products come to the market that don't have the money behind them, that don't have the ability to stay on the shelf because they haven't addressed the needs of the retailer who's going to have to sell that product in their store. <coughs> so today what we're going to do, <coughs> I'm going to talk to you about getting into the market. And uh, Mark did it to talk about a few of these things. And we're going to, we overlap a little bit on the channel side, but I'm going to take a slightly different approach. I'm going to talk to you about alignment with these customers. How do you build that alignment? And then the last thing is this retail plan, because you need a plan to sell your products. And <coughs> At Skew Food, we work with a process, and Michael talked about their process. I only have four parts of mine, so I don't know if that's like, you know, so much percentage less or what, but anyway, we talk about understanding consumers, which is critical. You have to start with the consumer. In my opinion, you need to understand who's going to buy your product. It's not the innovative process. It's not the fact that you've got so much worth of byproducts that you say, oh, okay, I'm going to find a need for it. What does the consumer need? Where is that opportunity in the marketplace? The next thing is alignment with those retailers that you're gonna, who are going to sell that product for you. How do you figure them out, understand them? The next thing is building that retail plan. So if you've got 40 points built into your cost of goods that you can reinvest in shelf promotions and do all the things you need to do. And then the most important part of this whole process is building trust. And I can tell you unequivocally that the suppliers that I wanted to work with at Lava that came in and sat across the desk from me were the ones that I trusted. If I didn't trust you, even if you're Kellogg's or somebody like that, you're not going to get the same opportunity because I don't trust you. And when that level of trust, the, the way we look at it is we call it a triangle of trust, actually, between the retailer, the supplier, and the consumer. And when you can start to get that happening, it's magic. And I've seen it, and it works. If you don't have it, it's a grind, and you're going to spend a lot of money. So. So that's the process we work with. I did put a handout on your table there that you can take back with you. It's what the questions that I would ask you through this process, that, and I'm not gonna take you through each one of it, but you're welcome to take that, and if you wanna have a chat, we can do that. But that, those are the questions that I would ask you through this process. So consumers. Consumers are changing. Now, I do, I do have a copy of my book, and I'm going to ask you a few questions through the presentation. So if you don't win it this time, you might have another chance the next time, okay? So a la carte was written for suppliers in the industry, and what I did was I wrote this so that you, it helps you understand what the retailers are after. Every chapter is a different priority of the retailer, and it helps you understand what they're looking for. So can anybody tell me what that is on the screen there? And I think the people from Perennia are excluded, because you people know too much about this stuff. I think I'd, I'd call it leafy green. Leafy green. Well, that's a big category. Yeah. i got to be a little more yeah. narrow than that. Are we going up? Lobuck. Where Lobuck. 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 You're yeah. close. You're saying a regular? Is it Lovage? Is it what? Lovage. Well, now, Gail, you're going to a place I don't understand. You're not supposed to bring up a product I don't understand. <laughs> Sorry. It's about that. Maybe you has got another name of Daycom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're you're the closest, so I will give you the copy of the so congratulations. Because I'll grow this one in my backyard. Eh? Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And what Asian... Disqualified. <laughs> it looks like what I mowed down. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, the reason I put this up on the screen, and it's actually, in the agriculture world, this is referred to as tillage radish. So, in a corn field, growers here in, in Nova Scotia would put that, they would grow that between the rows of corn, and at the end of the season, when they, when they harrow everything down, that is a nutrient that goes back into the soil. So, one of my clients has a corn stand in the Annapolis Valley, and a woman came up to the corn stand, <coughs> and she says, she's buying corn, and she said, she's looking, the field is right there, and she said, um, could I go and get some of that stuff? And it's just a high school student they have working at the corn stand, and she said, yeah, I guess so. I mean, they just pile it under. I mean, what the heck? I don't care if you want to take some, take it, right? So this woman went in and <coughs> took some and left. The next day, the farmer who owns the field is driving by, and there is a full-on harvest going on in the middle of the road. So oh, no. There are vans parked on the side of the road. There are garbage bags <laughs> of tillage radish being taken out of the field. 
And if any of you are into agriculture, you know that it's really, not, you know, it's fine if people want to go in and just take whatever they want, right? I mean, it's not like you're trying to earn your living from this stuff. You just go and take whatever you need, right? So he stops, and he's, you know, a big imposing guy, and he marches into the field, and he's like, okay, what's going on here? So this lady comes over, and she goes, well, it's me, and, and they said I could take it, and he said, well, you could take a bit, or, you know, the whole field. And, and so, so he's, he's like, okay, well, what are you doing with this? And so she said, we just immigrated here from Syria. And he knew. I mean, these were all Syrian people that were in the field. We just immigrated from Syria. This is something that we have at home, and we have not seen it since we left Syria. And we are so excited to be able to see it. And we use the, the radish part for something. They use the leaves for another thing. And for them, it was like being back home. Hmm. So our <coughs> consumers are changing here. And it doesn't matter whether you're talking about pet food category consumers produce category consumers, the marketplace is changing, and we as producers and processors have to adapt. So if you're going to develop products, and Mark took you through sort of this change in the pet food category, but where it's gone, you got to stay on top of that because that's what consumers are looking for. Retailers don't want another kibble. I'm telling you right now. So you gotta, you got to stay on top of the trends. <coughs> another thing, plant-based protein. I mean, these products were in the stores two years ago, right? Now you see like eight feet of Beyond, Bur Beyond Meat Burgers and all this stuff everywhere. Mm. It's changing so fast, so make sure you stay ahead of it. Are the retailers ahead of the curve or are they kind of just kind of following the curve because they look at their numbers and what's moving off the shelf, do you know what I mean? Retailers are <coughs> people who operate stores. They depend on you to bring those things into them and say, you know what, this is worthy of being on your shelf. And I think a lot of times people feel that the Sobeys, the Lavas, the Walmarts, or even the pet smarts of the world drive that. They don't. No. They're responding to consumer need. So it's your job to understand what's going on with the consumer okay. and bring the opportunity for me. Okay. All I'm really doing is giving you a space on my shelf. Now I'll charge you and do all and I'll treat you nasty and all that kind of stuff, but I'm giving you a space to sell your product. Mm. It's your job to bring that innovation to me. Okay. I will tell you sometimes if I trust you what's selling, but it's really your job. Mm -hmm. Well, not your job at a co-op, but no. their job. <laughs> okay, so getting to market. So we talked a little bit about co-packers, so I just wanted to share with you that working with a co-packer is kind of like getting married on the beach in Yarmouth, okay? Um, that is a big relationship to enter into. <laughs> no, I, don't know, I don't know what that looks like. No. Um, but if you're going to work with a co-packer to bring these products to market, you need to think long and hard about that. Or if you are going to be a co-packer, you need to think long and hard about the people you want to work with on the other side. And I just have a bit of a laundry list that I'll, I'll just share with you, but there's a ton of things that you need to assess. It's not just about can you make something. There's so many different things. You know, do you have the right equipment to do the process that we need? And in all this raw and innovative technology going on, do you have what we need? Um, is it part of your core competency, right? Or are you just have some excess capacity in a part of your plant and you want to charge somebody something? So there's a lot of different things. Do you have storage to, to be able to store the amount of product we need to supply the, the distribution that we want to do? Do you have proximity to the markets? And that's one of the things in our part of the world. I live in St. Margaret's Bay, so I know what you've, you face sometimes <coughs> is that in Canada, a third of the market is in Ontario. So if you're going to produce a product, sometimes it's better to do it up there. Sometimes it's a lot more efficient to drag your components up there and find somebody to make it close to the market because freight is really a bad expense. I'm telling you right now, consumers don't care what kind of nice looking truck you put it on. They just want it on the shelf where they want to buy it. So think about the proximity to the market, capacity, you know, can they do what you need today? Can they do what you need tomorrow? It, sometimes it's a good interim step to get you to market, but it's, there's a lot of a control. And the biggest thing, which I put the biggest check mark on the bottom is values. You've got to find somebody who has the same value as you in the marketplace. You cannot work, it will fail. I've seen it too many times where you get into a relationship with somebody and then they go, oh, well, you know, we're just gonna cut some corners. And you're going, well, I can't cut corners. I'm in the premium segment of the market. And they're like, yeah, well, you know, they won't notice, you know, the dumpster diving for pigs or whatever. Oh, okay. <laughs> scaring me, you're scaring me. <clears throat> okay, so let's talk about getting into the market. So one option for you is direct selling. So has anybody here heard of this business, Fuego Diablo? Mm -hmm. You have? My dad, he's, he's ordered from it. Has he? Was it any good? <laughs> yeah. Was it good? Yeah? 
So this is a business started by a guy in Halifax named Matt McQuarrie, and it is premium, premium, high-end steaks only sold online. So he started a business, developed a product, so he's he sources these high-end, some of it's Wagyu beef, some of it's you know USDA prime, some of it's Angus beef, he's got different options for you, but it is 100% done online. So that's one option for you. And in this pet food category, you can do that. We talked about shipping, but if depending, you know, I mean, if you're into small, lightweight pet treats, shipping online is not that big of a problem. And he's been in business five or six years now, so unless he's losing a ton of money, he must be doing something that's, that's allowing him to stay there and, and keep going at it. So if you're looking for a good steak this weekend, you might want to try it out. <laughs> so the pros to this is there are very low barriers to entry. Anybody, you can get into this, you can get your own website for a few thousand dollars, and, or if you've got a, <laughs> a kid or a nephew or somebody <laughs> that's good at that stuff, you can do it. But, so it's pretty easy to get into this. Um, it's your best margin. I mean, you're keeping everything yourself, right? You, you don't have to share anything with me, the retailer or the distributor or anything else. And the, the nice thing about this, and sometimes this is a good way to start, is you have that direct relationship with the consumer. And I cannot overemphasize how important that is to have that direct relationship with the consumer. Even after you grow and you get into it and, and perhaps some of the seafood products you have, even on that side, You've got to stay in touch with what consumers want. If not, you will be left behind. So make sure you take advantage of that. If you're going to do direct selling, like can I just add another pro to that? Mm -hmm. If the uh, you can do subscription based. I'm getting to that. Oh, sorry. I'm getting <laughs> <to> that. <laughs> you are correct. Um, the subscription model is definitely something that's becoming more popular, and pet food is a perfect opportunity for that. Right? These animals seem to need to eat regularly. <laughs> so, yeah, strange thing about that. Um, and on the consumer side, if, if you're doing direct selling, take advantage of it. Talk to them, ask them what they want, ask them if they like it. They're a huge resource for you. So the cons on this is that you've got to do all the work. It's all on you. So you got to have that relationship with the consumer, you got to get it to them, you got to have the, the website relationship, you got to do e-commerce, I mean there's Shopify and things you can use now, but <coughs> y it's all on you. You've got to find, create awareness, I mean it's not nice to have access to the World Wide Web, it's another thing for the whatever billion people we got out there in the world to find you now. So you've got to create that awareness, and, and that's a job, that is a big job, because mm -hmm. you're in a, there's no easy category anymore. You know, pet is nice because we kind of go, well, people will spend a bit of a premium and, and there's, you know, there's things going on, but I'm telling you, there is no easy category to get into. If there were, other people would be all over it. So, uh, the next thing is you have to figure out shipping, and Mark referenced this earlier, that shipping in this category, especially on the food side, is a challenge because you've got big, you've got bulk. And Canada is one of the worst countries in the world to try to do this thing because we've got 36 million people now spread out over such a huge geography that it's just expensive. So shipping is, is definitely a deterrent. And the other thing I would challenge you about is it really your core competency. And I think you have to really look yourself in the mirror and say, do I want to get up in the morning every day and deal with Mrs. Smith or Mr. Jones or whoever it is who's in Edmonton who's pissed off because they couldn't get the package open or whatever. You know, there's headaches that come with direct selling too. Mm. So, but sometimes it's a nice step into the market. So this is an unbelievable opportunity, right? I mean, you just get your product up on Amazon and you are good to go, right? I mean, it is like... <coughs> right? My book is on Amazon if you want it. I'm, but unfortunately, that island in the South Pacific that I was going to buy is not materialized yet. So, you know? But Amazon is an opportunity. And Amazon is sort of the next step of direct selling now. Um, it's really, it's, it's not that hard. Uh, you can definitely get your product up there. Uh, if you're going to go on, is there anybody here selling on Amazon now? You are? And what product is that in? What category? Sports. Sports cat. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And you like it? You don't like it? It's good for me. It's good for you. Yeah. It's amazing how big a percentage now. I was doing some work in a different category, and it was more on the, on the health category side of things and dry grocery. And one of the big businesses in the U.S., you know, one of the leaders in the category, still 40% of their volume comes off Amazon. 60% of ours. 60%. Wow. So. It's, and there's choices you have to make. I mean, we could be here all day talking about how to get an item listed up on Amazon and that kind of thing, but one of the big choices you need to make at the beginning is whether you're going to do the fulfillment or not, or whether it's going to go through Amazon's fulfillment. 
because now with Prime, everybody's familiar with Prime, right? You mm -hmm. pay seventy nine or ninety nine dollars, I can't remember, a year, and if, and the shipping is on a lot of items is included. So if you're part of their Prime network, then you're a lot more likely to sell product on Amazon. If you're not on Prime, then shipping can be a deterrent for consumers. Mm -hmm. So, and they've done that for a reason, right? They want you in their stable. <laughs> so. So there's lots of different decisions, but you can get yourself up on Amazon relatively easily. Um, as far as the pros, there, again, it's pretty low barrier to entry. You can figure it out. I did it myself for my book, so if I can do it, I'm sure that all of you can. Um, you know, you get access to millions and millions and millions of people, right? They're, they're on there all the time. And Amazon are so good at listening to what you're talking about on your phone and sending you promotion pieces the next day for it. So if I start talking about baseball now, I'm going to get stuff for your product probably. Uh, <coughs> and and if you do decide to go with the Prime thing, then there are, the shipping part of it is easier than doing it yourself. So, um, and then the other thing about Amazon is you still can do a good job of understanding that consumer because you can get information about who's buying your product and that is so key in this marketplace. Mm -hmm. So some of the cons, uh, control. So Amazon, as they learn more and more about selling products, they're doing more and more a job of taking control a bit from suppliers. And if your product doesn't sell on Amazon, they will very quickly tell you that it's not moving. I don't know, I mean, if you're doing okay, then that's good, but. They'll be, but they'll yeah. be less to you if you're not performing. That's right. They're no different than any other retailer, right? I mean, they've only got so much bandwidth for product, and if you're not turning, you don't belong. So, it's no different. Um, competition, I mean, everybody's there, and it's very easy to compare one to another on mm -hmm. Amazon. You know, it's all right there. You can do it from your couch, or you can do it from your kid's soccer game. So you've got to be ready to compete in the marketplace. And then the last thing you have to always remember if you're on Amazon, if you're going to take the next step, or, or at the same time that step to retail, uh, it's not just consumers who look at Amazon. It's also your customers who look at Amazon. <coughs> So if they look at Amazon and go, why are you $9.99 here and you're coming in and trying to sell it to me for $8.50? It's not going to work, people. i got to make 30 points. Like You're making me uncompetitive already. So just remember that they're looking at what's going on on Amazon. Too. Amazon will always be cheaper. <laughs> and it creates uh, just yeah. an interesting thing because we sell through Walmart and Amazon. Oh, yeah. And they both compete on price. Sure. So they drive to the bottom. It's a race to the yeah. bottom. Yeah. Yeah and they'll lose money on sales just to have those sales. Mm -hmm. It doesn't affect us because they pay us <coughs> Right, money. yeah. But if you're trying to maintain a certain level of, of, of pricing yeah. in the marketplace, they it's, it. it's, 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 mm. uh, you, you lose control <coughs> over that. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, a couple other things on Amazon just before we move on. So the subscription model that Michael brought up, so Amazon are starting to become much more active in subscription boxes. So this is where you pay you know, $10 a month and a box arrives for your pet every month from Amazon with new toys and new treats and new things and you're a hero in the household. Um, but these are great gift ideas. People are using this a lot now as a <coughs> gift idea. So if you can get yourself into a subscription box, um, that's an opportunity. You can do it yourself or you can partner with other people. There's lots of people who do this kind of as a business, right, where they put these different boxes together. Mm. So. I have another copy of my book. Does anybody know what that is? And you're not allowed to talk, Doug, because you probably know what this is. So does anybody know what that is? What that's called? I'll even let you pray if people can this <laughs> stuff. Nobody? So if you people want to work in this marketplace, you got to know what's going on out there. Is it a free No. Nope. Is it a paw protector? A paw protector? Yeah, because it elbows down. No. Or emotion. Does it evaluate your... Does uh, it quality? give different food, types food of food every no. day? Like it gives them a different choice? You people are thinking way menu? too hard. Here. You know <laughs> what it is? Read the back. You can't see it. I'm yeah. looking at the thing on the right. Do you know what it is? It's if you're a selling brush. Huh? For the Okay. On the right. Yeah. Okay. I got to keep going. I can't oh, wait for you. Skin skin coat, no. no skin so this is. Okay. I'm keeping the book. Food <laughs> 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 accessory. No, it's not. No. Okay. <laughs> what is it? Big selling people. Stop focusing on the product. What did I tell you at the beginning? You got to think about selling the great products. It's a free gift. This is Amazon Dash. Oh. 
Amazon yeah. Dash, you pay four ninety nine right. for that little button. That's right. You get a four ninety nine credit we from Amazon. It, you Every time you're out of that dog food or whatever that stuff like, is, you, you, you press, you press the, button the button and it <laughs> magically comes to your doorstep. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I've seen it. It doesn't look like that. No. no? Oh, yeah. <laughs> this one might be the one you're using. Oh, right. <laughs> so I'm looking through these Amazon Dash buttons and I'm going, underwear, really? Yeah. Like really? You have a different button. For every product? Like Not every product, but they have a lot of different ones. So so if you're going through a lot of Calvin Klein underwear <laughs> and you're the problem. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you got a problem. It's a different type of story. Yeah. But you know what? It's easy to get it. Yeah. You just put that on your dresser or well, yeah. wherever you, I don't know, maybe in the bathroom. I don't know, wherever you need to put it and you press the button and your Calvin Klein underwear oh, magically yeah. comes That's to you the funny. next day. Yeah. Well, they yeah they yeah. they were getting some returns, but but it's just there's so many ways, and and the thing about Amazon is that I think we get wound up about the sort of the concept of Amazon. It's not the concept. What they're doing is they're making it very easy for people to buy product, that's and that's serious. what this is all about. Yeah. That's what you're in this racket for. So find the way that's the easiest for the right consumer to access your product. Mm. And also so you can make some money out of it. So you want to do key account sales. So this is another way to get to market. We talked about direct, we talked about Amazon. Now you want to take your product on the road and you want to go to Sobeys, you want to go to Lava's, you want to go to Walmart, you want to go to PetSmart or Global Pet Foods, whoever it is, you want to get your stuff listed. That's another option for you. Lots of people try to do that. In Canada, that's not out of the ordinary to do that. In the US, you don't do that. You use a broker. But in Canada, you can still access the retailers yourself. So there are some pros to that. You maintain control. So it's you dealing directly with your customer. You're sitting across the table from them, and you can have that conversation about whether you're going to be there or not. You're the face of the business. And I can tell you again from my own personal experience, I appreciated knowing who was the business. I don't like dealing with somebody who's between somebody who's between somebody and then the decision maker. I like dealing with the person who can come in and go, yeah, we're gonna do that. Let's get on that right now. Let's work on it. Not, I gotta go back, blah, blah, blah. And the next thing is you understand them. I told you you gotta understand the consumer. You definitely have to understand these retailers. So if you're gonna do key account sales and you're gonna call on them and go in and sit across the desk, you can say, so, how's the category doing? Is this raw stuff really, I was at this conference and this Mark guy says it's the next thing and I gotta get out of everything else, like is that where you're going or what? You can have that conversation with them if it's you who's in their office. So then on the con side, they won't call you back. They ignore you, okay? I'm just telling you right now, you know, you're 1% of the category sales, the person from Mars, you know, she was in last week and she's 25% of my category sales, who am I dealing with? I'm dealing with her. I find I find on the retail side the buyers change so often. There's a, a that's thing. a strategy. <laughs> well, it is. Big yeah. sporting goods yeah. that has to change sure. the buyers every three months, so yeah. you never know who you're dealing. Category management in retail is a great proving ground. You prove yourself as a category manager. They're like, oh, okay, we need to move you up because you're you got you got some abilities and, and that kind of thing. So. So category managers, and it, you just got to accept it. It's part of the game. It's part of your job to educate into those category managers. So look at it as a positive and say it's another opportunity for me to tell my story as opposed to, oh my God, really, is that wrong? So they do change. And another thing, which unfortunately in our part of the world is that geography is a disadvantage. You know, if you're going to sell into these national retailers, they are not here. You know, we have Sobeys in Stellarton still, and if you're dealing in pet, the grocery category is still in Stellarton. Other than that, you're on a plane to deal with anybody. And that can be tough, right? It's, it's not easy, and it's a cost. It's a cost that you have in your business that your competitor who's close to their offices does not have. So you just have to accept that. Now, I would tell you, that video conference now, like if you use Zoom and some of that kind of stuff, it is becoming way more acceptable now. I've got more and more category managers now where I can deal with the client. So if I have a client who's in BC, and we'll have a Zoom meeting with the category manager in Ontario. So it saves us all trying to fly there in the middle of a snowstorm. They're becoming much more willing to, 
to do that kind of stuff. And they see it as better too, because you can have a 20 minute meeting. If somebody flies all the way from DC, you go, well, I gotta give them an hour, right? I, I, I kinda gotta give them an hour. So, so the technology is helping. Another way for you to get into the market is brokers. So this is part of Acosta, so they would be a broker who would go in and represent your products to the retailers. And, uh, and this is one that specializes in pet. There's a lot of them that are more sort of general practitioners, but brokers are another option for you. Um, the pros on that side is they do have access to the offices. They are in there much more frequently than you would ever get in there. The, the second thing for me, if you're gonna use a broker, you need to have retail coverage. If you use a broker who's only gonna call in the office, I think that's it's almost a waste of time, if you ask me. They need to have coverage in the stores to tell you what's going on. Is your product in the store, on the right place, at the right price? Is the promotion that we spent money on happening? All those kind of things. So they've got to have retail coverage. And brokers can deal with a lot of headaches for you. Dealing with retailers is really a pain. It is a challenge. And they make it that way because they're trying to weed out the, the weak. So brokers can fill out the 67 page listing form and they can deal with the phone calls about, well, you know, your product doesn't weigh exactly what you said it was gonna weigh and, and some of those kind of things. They can take some of those headaches off your plate. Now on the con side, you're one of many. They have a whole bunch of principles that they have to have in their stable to make their business work. So you've gotta do volume to be on top of the heat. You're only gonna get attention when you do volume. So they will execute your programs. You still have to develop them. They will go in and sell your program to the retailer. They'll say, you know, Doug wants to invest uh, in, a, in an Air Miles promo this week and he wants to do this and he wants to do that. But they won't really develop it. You still got to do that part of it. They don't do distribution. Most of them do not do distribution. So you still got to get your product from wherever you're manufacturing it, either to a warehouse or to each individual retail location. And usually a broker is going to charge you around 5%. It's totally negotiable, but you should be able to get it for about 5%. So. They'll tell you they're worth more, but you can tell them I said they're worth less. <laughs> uh, the distributor. So this is the last option of getting to market, and in the pet category, this is very common because there's so many locations out there. What did you, how many did you say there were? Like 15? 2,000, yeah. So that's like a huge amount of retail to get to. So distributors are an option for you. And they'll take your product, you usually have to get it to their warehouse, and they will pack a truck full of different items from different suppliers and get it out to retail for you. Now the, the pros on the, on the distributor side is that they, are, they do bring some of these efficiencies on the shipping, right? They've got trucks going to these locations. They have existing relationships with the retail outlets, which you cannot, you know, it's a ma monumental task to build all those relationships. Um, they should have the retail coverage. They should be in these stores regularly to tell you what's going on and make sure your products are getting out there. And they can also deal with a lot of headaches, like the brokers can. So distributors, especially in this category, can perform a, a very valuable. If you're selling into somebody like a Lava or Sobeys or a Walmart, chances are they're gonna wanna go through their own warehouse because they want the freight going to their stores on their trucks. They don't want the <laughs> trucks at the back door. But on the pet specialty side, it's more likely to have a distributor. The cons. Um, is that they're probably stronger with the independents than the chain. So it's going to be a little bit slower volume build for you. They're probably not going to say, I can get you into a hundred stores right away. We're going to do this one, and we're going to do that one, and we're going to do this one. Um, again, you are like the broker, you're one of many that's coming into their warehouse. So if you're not doing the volume, they're not going to spend a lot of time on you. And, and I appreciate Martin sharing the, a little bit of numbers with me because I was dealing with the food segment, but it's around plus or minus 30% you're gonna have to pay for a distributor to take your products to all these retail outlets for you. So, so that's how you can get into the market. So let's talk about channels for a minute. So the, my message here, the reason I put all these logos on the screen is you have choice. You need to figure out the best place for your product to be. And in my world, again, it goes back to the consumer. Who's gonna buy your product? Where are they shopping? Are they shopping at Loblaw? Are they shopping at Canadian Tire? Are they shopping at Giant Tiger? Pick your poison, and you gotta go after that. So those are some options for you. Here's some more. There's the specialty pet category. And don't forget specialty food as well. Like As these pet owners are becoming more and more uh, engaged in and what they're feeding their animals, specialty food, like a farm boy or somebody like that, might be a great opportunity for you to get in there. Um, the vets is another channel, and I think that's one that may get 
I, when I look at this category, I think that's one that may come back to life a little bit because I think they've been hurt by what's happened. And if, they, if I was a vet, I'd be like, okay, I gotta figure out how to get on this better because I'm missing a big opportunity. I am the voice of experience. I am the expert. Why are they trusting Google to go to PetSmart and not deal with me, right? So if it was me, I'd be all over that. Uh, and then, and I think drug is an opportunity for you too, depending on where you're at. But we're going to see more and more food sold in drug. So if people are going in there for some of their food items, that's why Loblaw blah, bought Shoppers, right? 1,500 stores in urban markets. You go to Shoppers in Toronto now, it's like 60-70% food. So pet food can definitely be a part of that. And then online. So there are some that are just online only and some where it's the online version <coughs> of the retail format. And then you've got some now like Sobeys who are building a $200 million warehouse in Toronto that will open this year that is only to service online business. So the whole online thing is really evolving so fast. And does anybody here know what Penguin Pickup is? You know? Yeah. yeah. Nobody here? People. This is your market. You got to get out and understand. This is in the Maritimes. This is not a Toronto thing. Frozen food? No. Nope. So Penguin Pickup has a deal with Walmart where you can order product online from walmart.ca and it gets shipped to Penguin Pickup and then you go there to pick it up. So it's just like their version of click and collect, but they now do it. So you can do it in your minus. I don't know if Yarmouth has it or not. I didn't check, but Penguin Pickup is like a standalone thing. And their latest thing is they've opened a bunch in right in the core heart of downtown Toronto. So if you live in one of those condo buildings with your $1.8 million condo, you can order from walmart.ca and not have to drive to Mississauga and get it delivered to Penguin Pickup right there for you. Oh, cool. So it's really changing and you got to stay on top of it. And here's just a couple of facts. So Brick Meets Click is out of the U.S., but they're telling us that in the U.S. food industry, that the compound annual growth rate in, in bricks and mortar is 1.3% and in online it's 13%. So 10 times higher growth in the online part of the business. So if you want to grow, you got to be there. Amazon just bought Whole Foods. Whole Foods so I heard that. See, <laughs> see home delivery. Or yeah, well, you're, you're getting it now. Whole Foods do do delivery and now with Instacart and, and everything with in the US. Yeah. 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 Whole Foods is a very different experience in yeah. the last six months. If you're up there, if you're in a Toronto or, or uh, Vancouver or Calgary, you should get in and see it because Amazon are starting to Amazonize Whole Foods. So. And the other thing I would tell you just on the online thing, in the food industry, when people buy fresh online, that is the indication that they're moving their whole order to online. So in Asia now, we're seeing more than a third of the volume is being bought online of fresh foods. So that's where the market has always been the leader in Asia for online food buying. And so we will just be following on that trend at whatever pace we decide to follow it in Canada. So, so we're going to talk about alignment now. So one thing you need to do is you've got to understand your customers. So if I'm a retailer, I work on margin. When you're a processor, producer, you work on markup, right? I work on margin. So you need to understand there's a very important difference between margin and markup. And when you come in and talk to me as a retailer, you need to be talking margin. I don't want to talk. If you talk markup to me, I'll go, you don't understand me. And you need to come back when you do. Now, I wouldn't say it quite as mean as that. But. So we do have a tool at Skew Food to help you understand the difference. So if you come and talk to me afterwards, I'll give you one of my profit wheels, which helps you figure out margin and markup. And there is a difference. And if you do a whole program for a retailer on markup, you're going to get fleeced because I'm going to take more money from you. So loyalty programs. You need to understand what these people are trying to do. They're trying to differentiate their offering with loyalty programs. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to play in this arena, you've got to play in the loyalty program area. And it can be very effective because they can tell you who did buy on Air Miles if you're doing something with Sobeys. Okay, I have another book. We'll try again. The Amazon Dash thing didn't go so good, so we'll try again. So, what is Walmart's loyalty program? They don't have one. Well, they do. I would argue with you. Is it the Walmart MasterCard? Yeah. No. 
It's Walmart gift cards, isn't it? No. <laughs> it's rollbacks, people. It's price. That's it's the price. Lord. They keep ratcheting the price down, down, down. That's the Lord people, right? That's what they do. Rollbacks? Rollbacks. It's just all about price okay. and value. So if you're going to play in Walmart, you need to be prepared to go and offer better value to them. So when they say to you, I want to buy, Mark, you, I love your product, and let's do a deal, we're going to start at 10,000 cases. Are we good with 10,000 cases? You say, yeah. And we say, well, you know what? Because we're such a great retailer, we're going to get that number up to 20. What's your cost going to be? You've got to be prepared to say that I'm going to be able to take it down a little bit. <laughs> I never touched a vendor. <laughs> you don't have to. Squeeze them on price. So, so you need your underwear, but yeah. yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's why I need more underwear. <laughs> so, if you're going to sell into a lot of these, you got to be thinking about private label. Is that the right avenue for you or not? Do you want to build a brand and invest the money, or do you want to go the private label route? And pri private label pet food is big business. I'm telling you, they, they sell a lot of this stuff, and it can be an advantage to you, but it's not right for everybody. So. You need to think it through and have an answer before you go and talk to them. There's nothing wrong with saying no. I, I'm, I'm, I totally accept that answer, but you want to think it through. Do not have them say, hey, we love your idea. Can we do private label? Oh, uh, I don't know. I never thought about that. Uh, you know, what, what would be involved with that? Uh, and I go, you don't understand me. Come back when you do. So private label can be an option for you. So the thing for me on this alignment piece is find the right shelf. Not any shelf is the right shelf for your product. So when I'm in, like that's a specialty pet food store close to where we live, they've got that stuff. I'm blown away by the refrigerated pet food in the middle of Sobeys and Loblaw Law now, like the fact that, that they, you know, here we have refrigerated pet food, but you can't buy like refrigerated pasta sauce or something that a person would want to eat, but they put electrical in the middle of the pet food aisle so that we can plug in a, a fridge for pet food. So, mm. But it's changing and find the right shelf. Is 35,000 people going through a law law store every week right for you with no customer service and just being there on the aisle and competing based on your package and whatever consumer marketing you've done and your price? Or is it better to be in a specialty store where somebody can say, oh, look, look at what we have here. We've got this great new thing and, you know, let me show you a picture of Mark. He's the guy who makes it and, you know, tell the story for you. What is the right shelf? And I'll give you an example. So, you're familiar with ADL or PEI? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, ADL uh, produced a lot of cheese. Very little of it is sold around here, and very and even less of it was sold under their brand. So, this was a project where I worked on with them, and what we they wanted to be in the dairy section. They never were competitive in the dairy section before. It's always Kraft, it's Saputo, it's uh, Parmalat. So you're dealing, you know, we're talking big players here. So what we did was we developed a size that was different. Everybody competes on 454 gram cheese block. You know, the Black Diamond, the Kraft, the Cracker Barrel, all that stuff. Only sells when it's 377 or 499, regular price 799. So it's a real high low category. 80% of the volume is on special. So we came with a separate, a different size. They're the only cheese in that section that is made with 100% Canadian milk. Every other one has modified milk ingredients, which could come from anywhere in the world. And they're not playing the high-low game, they're playing an EDLP game. So they're $4.99, they should be if the retailers weren't gouging, some of them are $5.49 now, but if they should be $4.99 every day on the size that they went with. So it's a quality cheese that differentiates, and you get shelf space when you do that. But don't come with what they've already got. You've got to bring something to the market that's different and give that retailer something that's going to sell that's different than just one more that I can put in the ad for three ninety nine. Merchandising on that is in a separate location. Actually, that it was in an ad that week. Yeah. It is in the regular dairy section. Yeah. yeah. I actually couldn't find the photo. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Flaw in the presentation. Yeah, yeah. I know. Sorry. Yeah. Thanks for pointing that out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> this alignment piece. So the way that I put it is different strokes for different folks. So these are my three kids. So you met Grace on the left earlier. So Grace is now 12. She does gymnastics. She plays soccer. She is like straight ahead threat. You talk to Grace and you say, Grace, can you take the dog out please? Yep. Yeah. Okay, it's my turn. I'll take the dog out. Georgia is 13. Georgia does dance. 
The world revolves around pink stuff. <laughs> and you say, Georgia, can you take a dog out? Well, I don't know if it's my turn or not. I'm going to have to check with Grace. And I'm really busy right now because I'm trying to get my homework done. And I'm on the and, <laughs> and on the right is Will. Will is 6'2", 295 pounds. He plays football at St. FX. He just finished his, or he's in his first year at St. FX. And if I need Will to take the dog out, I have a different strategy with him as well, right? So, yeah. <laughs> I think even, even the pepperoni would probably work. <laughs> So, my point is, each one of these retailers are different. So, they're just like my kids. I have a different strategy for each one of them. They're, they all grew up in the same place, same values, all that. The retailers are all trying to sell pet food or sell food or whatever they're trying to do. But you need a different strategy for each one. So just remember my kids and, and develop your different <laughs> strategy. So quickly, I left the feedback form on the table. At SKU Food, we have is really like an online resource for processors in the industry. So if you fill it out and write the word membership on it, I will send you a two-week membership in SKU Food so you can see what's in there. And it's all about how to develop relationships with retailers, how to figure out some of these things. There's a lot of things that I put in there that I've my experience over the years from working in this industry for 30 years. And I'll give you access to it all for a couple of weeks. So if you just fill it out with your name and your email and write membership, then I'll collect them after and, and send you that so that you can you can see what it's about and get access to it for free for a couple of weeks. So the last thing about being successful in this business is you need a retail plan. Do not just develop a product. As you're developing it, think through about how is this sucker going to sell and what am I going to have to do to sell it. So you've got to figure out where are you going to make investments. Are you going to put signage in the aisle? So if your French is mustard and you've got all kinds of great publicity because you're the only ketchup made in Canada now with Canadian tomatoes, you're going to put some signs up in the stores and, and key off on that, right? So what is that point of differentiation that you need to invest in? Um, Piece by chocolate from Anna Ganesh, you know, it's been a success story with Sobeys. So they invested in shippers to get their product out of the confectionery set. They can't compete with Lint, right? They're like a jerked off little place in Anna Ganesh making chocolate bars. They don't make a million a day. So they want to get out of the category and up by the front end. So they use merchandisers to do that. Berea Pasta, it's a coupon because they launched a new product that's gluten-free pasta. So it's coupons to get you to stop when you're going by that pasta section with about 5,000 SKUs and go, oh, there's something going on. What am I going to do? Van Dykes from, the Va from Caledonia, wherever they're from, um, you know, they're doing a promotion there with Air Miles and it's a price thing. So they're taking a dollar off. All these things, whether it's all of them, one of them, you've got to have a plan because if you don't, you will not move off the shelf. Unfortunately, in this industry, we have trained people to look for this stuff. <coughs> so now, <coughs> excuse me, Nielsen would tell you, over a third of the volume and almost half of the tonnage are on temporary price reduction. So I don't know if the number in the pet category is higher or lower than that number, but overall in this industry, in the, in the food industry, those are, that's what's happening out there. And it doesn't mean it has to be half price, but you've got to have a sign and you've got to create some awareness around what you're doing. Another thing, anybody know what that means? I would give you a book. <laughs> if you are, is there anybody here who sells to Walmart? Anybody? No? Okay. Indirectly, we sell to Copac. Oh, do you? Yeah. You know what that means? Um, off in no. 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 Off truck in front. No. We, we've uh, indirectly through a uh, broker, we've sold to Walmart. Okay. Do you know what that means? No. Okay. So here's a great example of a broker. So when you're done here, Go call the broker and ask them why you don't know what that means. <laughs> so I'm not the salesman. I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the salesman. Sorry, I bring my get my lava hat on sometimes. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Let me come back to me and Peter the speaker. So when you're done, you should talk to your salespeople and see if they understand what that means. So this is Walmart's number one priority this year: on time, in full. So if you are a supplier to them, you need to be on time with your deliveries and in full. If not, 
you're in trouble. You'll need that Calvin Klein underwear button. <laughs> so <clears throat> on time in full is their number one thing because they're saying if we don't have it when we need it, we're not going to sell it and it's going to cost us sales. So, so here's Lava. So if you're in the Lava office, this is a sign that you would see. So it talks about service level, which is exactly how many cases were on the purchase order versus what you ship. And they put the vendors up there. Nice if you're on the good side, right? Perfect. You say to the category, ah, I saw my name up on the sign there on the plus column. Or if you're on the bad column, you just turn around and go back and <laughs> get it fixed. So it shows you the importance that they put on service level, right? So they want the product when they want it, where they want it. Another big priority for them is labor. You are going to see huge changes on the retail side. And it doesn't matter whether it's the big food players or the specialty pet. Technology is having a huge impact at retail now. And they're trying to reduce labor costs. That's what this is all about. And the, part of it is to reduce the cost. Part of it is because they can't get people to do the job. Mm. They just can't. And I'm sure you're all struggling with a lot of those challenges yourselves. So if you can do things in your product and how you bring it to market that reduce labor costs for them, they will embrace you. So quickly, this is a P&L, just a very high level version of a P&L. But one of the things my experience has been the processors and producers always get so mad when they go in and they say, you're making 30 points on my product. I only make like five. It's not fair, you know, it's, it's ridiculous. But you can see there's a lot of expenses to running that retail business, and at the end of the day, most of them are at around 1% to 2%, bottom line. So don't get wound up about the margin they're charging. Focus on the things that you can control, okay? They won't change their category margin for you anyway. So. <laughs> okay, so as we're wrapping up, so one thing for me is that if you're going to get into this racket, I talked to you about 5% strategy and 95% execution. So how many people here are familiar with Hudson News? Have you seen it <coughs> at the airport? Yeah, mm -hmm. so a bunch of you, you see it, right? I'm not sure about you, but, but my impression of Hudson News was it's like the home of the $8 pack of gum and a yeah. $15 magazine. Mm -hmm. Is that fair? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So a couple of years ago, I was on my way to Toronto and I was doing some work for a company that was making juice. And we had to take the, the juice samples up and we were going to meet with some of the retailers. So I go to the airport in Halifax, check in at 7.30 in the morning, get to the WestJet counter, and the juice is packed in a styrofoam cooler. And the guy from WestJet comes over, he goes, oh, good morning. Uh, I'm sorry, but uh, we, we can't check that styrofoam cooler. We don't check those anymore because they break too easily. And I hate taking samples. Like, as a former retailer, taking samples is not something I like to do, but I was doing it at that time. So I go, okay, no problem. He says, just go down to Clearwater and get a box and you know, put it in the cardboard box and then we'll, we'll check it through. I go, no problem. So I go down to Clearwater and there's two women standing there. <laughs> so I go in and I, I mean, it wasn't like crazy lobster time, right? Okay, there's no lineup or nothing. I go in, I go this morning, explain my dilemma to them. And I said, can I, can I get a box from you? No. I go, well, I'll buy the box. Like, you know, if you need 10 bucks or whatever for the box, I'll buy the box, no worries. We don't sell the box. And if I did sell you the box, I'd have to charge you a $15 packing fee. <laughs> and now I'm mad, right? <laughs> now, I, I went in, I was nice, now I'm pissed off. And what she didn't realize that one of the departments I looked after at Lava was seafood. <laughs> oh yes, I do know people at Clearwater. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> moving on. I go, okay, Peter, calm down, take a pill. You know, we'll deal with it. I turn around, I look over. There's Hudson News across the hall. So I walk over there, and there was a woman working behind the desk there, and her name was Emily. And I said, explain my dilemma. I said, you wouldn't have a box, would you, that I could use? She goes, sure, I'm sure I got a box. Let me just call it back on. Within 30 seconds, this other woman appeared, a, per a box, perfect size. She said, we got packing tape. She helped me put my juice and ice packs and everything in, taped it all up. She's like, here's a marker, put your name on it and everything. And I'm like, thank you. Thank you for making a crappy thing easy for me. And now I go back to WestJet, I check in, my juice is gone. So then, I'm sitting upstairs at the gate, and I thought, you know what, Peter, you should do the right thing. You know what, that woman really did help you out. So I go online, and I look at Hudson News customer feedback or whatever. So I sent them a quick email. I just explained what had happened, and I said, you know, Emily was really pleasant and took the, you know, time to help me out. It was great. So within minutes, I get an email back, and it's not like a form, you know, thank you for your 
contacting Hudson News, blah, blah, blah. It was a personally written email. And it says, Peter, thank you for taking the time to let us know of your experience at the Halifax airport. Um, our brand promise is to be the traveler's best friend. And obviously, Emily is doing that for you today. So we'll follow up with Emily, but I just wanted to say thanks for letting us know. I'm not up at gate 18. Emily's going to get there. So I now go by Hudson News, and I go, there's my best friend when I go through the airport. And you buy the $8 package. I do. I go in, I see Emily, I buy the gum, and so Emily it's all. hasn't got your island already? <laughs> she might, actually, because let me just, I'm going to. Do one more thing, okay? So, a follow-up to that is, part of the reason I was going to Toronto was to go to the, our annual convention for the Canadian Association of Professional Speakers. One of the big, big name guys from the U.S. was there, you know, 50 grand an hour to speak. That's what it's working for in Yarmouth, right, Kim? Um, so, he's doing a breakout session. And I went to the breakout session, and he says, I'll be around until 3, and then I've got to catch my plane, because I'm my flight because I'm on my way to Las Vegas for the annual sales meeting for Hudson News. Huh. And I was like, oh, what's the chances of that, right? So I go up and talk to him afterwards, and I said, Steve, I just want to share what happened. And he's a big, big guy. And he looks at me and he goes, why would you do that? And I go, I'm sorry, I just was trying to share my experience. I thought it might be good. He goes, I have to rewrite my whole keynote now. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, oh, okay, good. So I don't hear anything. And the next day, I'm sitting at one of our sessions, and I get an email, and it's this, it says, Peter, my name is Karen. I'm the regional manager for Hudson News. I'm in the Wynn Theater in Las Vegas, and I'm crying because Steve Gillen just shared your story to our 3,000 sales people from across North America. And Emily is now a hero, and we're going to follow up with Emily when we get home. So this is going to be another picture of Emily with a big basket of stuff and flowers and everything. So anyway, you never know, right? You just never know where you're going to be. But my point is, your brand has to perform. So in Hudson News that day, they were executing their brand promise. So if you're going to bring these pet food treats or products to the market, they got to perform. You mm -hmm. have to do that to be successful. Right. So that's what it's all about. You, how to get to the market and developing that alignment or understanding the channel, what's the right shelf, making sure you have alignment with the customers you choose to work with and having that retail plan to sell your products. And, you know, it's really... I want to ingrain this in you that it's not about making great products to sell. It is so much about selling those great products you make. And uh, I'm really ex scared for you to be on this journey. So good luck with it. Thank you. So do we want to give everybody a chance to get a bite yeah, while we set up? Yeah, and then we can come back here and yeah. get, get started. So food's ready. Yeah. So just uh, to help yourself with all kinds of good stuff.
really surprised. So you would work on markup? Right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So markup side. So if your product costs is three dollars and you want to market it to say fifty percent, you're gonna start with your price. Retail side, we work on margin. So if you see a product in the store, that's what we're going to do. So we're going to put the $4 on the margin. The category margin is 30%. We put the 30 on the $4, and then we're going to actually say, okay, the product is So I find it a great tool to go in the store with everything that's nice. It's kind of like a slide rule. I remember that. Yeah, it's back to back concept. Yeah. Okay, quickly. The question is, so suddenly in April, which is the worst time for addicts to drink, because the seasons of Georgia's bank is closed, and they're spawning, and they get very, very thin. Yeah, and they're very, very thin, so the quality isn't very good. So they want to put ads, so the, the category manager want to put ads in April. So then they said, well, yeah. I said, well, can yeah. we can't come up with all the things, right? Mm -hmm. like, the so, like, you have like the worst radius. So, so, so how do we educate them? Or, well, I think you've got to... So they don't know that happens. Um, right. So I think it's, it's really a matter of getting yeah. out there. We're going to email them. Uh, we can get this stuff. We can get this stuff. And the other thing is that if you're trying to, if you're logging, you're trying to contribute to yourself with quality secret, there's three months of the year of not having to contribute to people. We've got nine months of the year. We've got nine months of the year. We've got nine months of the Or it could be a different one, they can give us three dollars So I think you have this supplier and our responsibility is to make those things. Thank you. Quite a good stack. I appreciate that. Not because we don't want to do it, it's because it's not the right time to do it. Yeah, they'll put strawberries in February. Yeah. Yeah, so they think they're swimming around at the time. And then the other thing I would say is that they should go learn it. Yeah. Every time you have a new thing, you need to get in front of me. Yeah, we can have a 
And I think that's the role. And then back off on the, what I do, what I do. It's more about what's the
Oh, that's so high. 
bit of a, a panel to open it up for, for some questions and anything specific. Um, we also have another panelist join. Join. I uh, wanted to give you a bit of a, a background around Margo. Uh, this is Margo White. She's with the Perennia. Um, and I'll, again, I'll read this because I can't recite everything. Okay, that's it. Just Margo. Margo from Perennia. Um, so. Uh, Margo's working with the uh, Perennia Food and Agriculture as Innovation Projects Coordinator. So we we work closely with, with Perennia on a, a number of things, and they were a key partner in our in our lobster bait challenge. And then this, so um, and soon to be having one of your staff members working out here tonight. So that's a that's a good thing. Shout out to Sarah Lowback in the back there. Yeah. Is, yeah. is that who's working with? Us? Yes. Oh, yeah. oh, I would have hazed her a little bit. Oh. Get to tell me this stuff. So Sarah's in real trouble. <laughs> um, so uh, maybe, uh, so she works as innovative project coordinator with a main focus on utilization of seafood byproduct managing uh, mobile wine bottling and filtration trailers, uh, pilot plant and, uh, equipment and staff as well as part of, of uh, the cannabis edibles and beverages team. So everything you ate here was laced with cannabis. So <laughs> <laughs> and wine on the side. And wine. <laughs> yeah. So if you feel funny after this, <laughs> it's some compliments of perennium. <laughs> so, so I know uh, uh, we had great presentations. Thank you very much. Um, and we just wanted to give you guys a chance to ask uh, questions of not that I can answer any of your questions, but we can ask questions of the, the panelists. You can ask me questions too and I'll make up an answer, but uh, it won't be as good as these guys. So we'll kind of open the floor if anybody has any pertinent questions that they want want to pose to the panel, we can start there. And everybody's going to be shy for the first 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Al. So um, we do a lot of product design and uh, process automation. Food products are new to us. Um, first question anybody asks me when they come in is, how do I protect my idea? Is there a patent equivalent in food? Are you looking at me? <laughs> anybody. <yeah. coughs> well, I'll, I'll give you my answer, and I'm sure that Mark, you've been through this yourself, so you probably have some insights for your process. But um, my experience has been that in food it is very hard and very expensive to try to protect what you're doing and uh, <clears throat> that unless you're willing to go to the end of the earth with litigation that it's very hard to, to get a payback for all the time and money that you're going to invest to try to patent a process or that kind of thing. You can patent a piece of equipment mm -hmm. to make something but the actual intellectual property that you have for the process, it's, it's my experience has been very hard to do that. And that's where I would say that you really want to find people that you can trust to work with. And if you don't trust them, then you need to walk away. One of the problems with the patent is you have to give up your ingredients and yeah. take a very minor change to that to uh, not infringe on the patent. Around, yeah. uh, so yeah. trade secret is probably more of a viable for a recipe mm -hmm. kind of formulation. Yeah, there's no, there's no real way to protect it. Like you can just, a lot of companies, anyways, they want to add a differentiating factor, so it becomes a non-issue. And then one interesting thing in the pet industry is like it's it's highly relationship based. So if you were a company and just copied another company, like an established company's product, and then tried to go to market with it, when you walk into the retail stores to sell your product, you'd be met with like a lot of hostility for doing that there it's, it's yeah because the relationship nature of the business well right, there's some integrity left somewhere <laughs> pet industry is wild west so it just there's a bunch of people that really like their dogs <laughs> i have a question about that we talk a lot about um uh, consumers and 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 how they're maybe different in this type of industry but so our, our pet parents, are they, are they really brand loyal? Or <coughs> if I have a product I, that I want to introduce and it's a, a smaller label, and maybe they don't know the label, will they try it? Or will they just stick with the brand that they know, period, and they just don't want, want to even try something new? It's, it, 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 
in my experience as a retailer, I found it wasn't difficult to get people to try different things as long as you can sell them on like the differentiating factor mm. um, for that product. And <clears throat> when, when you're looking at channels, like what Peter was uh, speaking to, like what channels you want to go to, he mentioned like whether you just want to sit on a shelf in a big box store versus being like a pet specialty store where you're getting that customer service aspect. Um, when you go pet specialty, what happens is those pet parents, because it's uh, there's so much emotion involved in the in industry, um, a lot of those pet parents advocate for your brand, and that's where you see the growth come from. It's more word of mouth. Um, they grow it, like you know, without you actually having to spend marketing dollars on it. So, the, the most recent study I read said showed that. They were more brand loyal to the pet food they bought than the old food they pet food bought. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> so one, <clears throat> I just want to add one more thing to that. I think one, from my perspective, one of the, the totally underutilized opportunities you have when you get these products developed are people like Mark when he ran the global pet food store. You've got to go out and talk to people about your product and get them to be advocates for you. Don't bother going to Sobeys or Loblaw or whatever. But when you, if you're going to go into the specialty pet channel, you've got to make the investment of time and resources to go and talk to people like him and say, here it is, look what it does for you, get him invested, and then he will talk to people for you. And it's totally underutilized, even in the food industry. Sorry. Uh, question, the trend line on pet ownership, uh, is it stable, up, down? In the, so going forward, what kind of, uh, is there any trends that are showing up in the pet ownership? Uh, I don't have like solid, solid numbers on it, but my gen like generally I can say that it, it, it's increasing. Um, and the reason why I say that is um, from like the shelter side of things. Uh, on the shelter side, they're having trouble like essentially um, keeping up with the demand for dogs. So... That would that would indicate to me that so that that's why we're looking to like rescue dogs from you see a lot now rescuing dogs from out of the country right. it's because there simply isn't <coughs> dogs within the country which is a good thing that that need homes mm. so that's all tied to demographics isn't it really mm -hmm. so it's hard to say may change it's, it's also become a cohort. cool thing to either have like a three-legged dog or um, <laughs> or a rescue from somewhere really? that's not local so like my dog's from brazil oh yeah well, my dog has two legs <laughs> that's why i put that picture of the greyhound up <laughs> So we've been out talking with folks like Sean, Dr. Ma, and others uh, who are interested in the pet food uh, business. But I think, from what I, I hate to paraphrase for you folks, but it seems that they've had inquiries from pet food manufacturers, particularly in the U.S. And so you pretty well, I think you're in a position where you have to take a price. You're not, you're not really in control. And, um, you know, it sounds like that's something you'd want to avoid, but I'd like to have your guys' thoughts on that. Do we not finish product or on a degree? We're off. You're on the waste. On the waste side, I think it's more like it, it's it's what you're describing, <coughs> um, where it's hard to like demand pricing on that. Um, when you shift into where you're providing that whole product. Um, to the to the manufacturer, then you, then actually you have the power in that instance. So like in my manufacturing experience, um, the raw ingredient cost for me just kept going up and up and up, and that's simply a, a, a consequence of the demand. So unfortunately, when looking specifically at seafood waste, because supply is so high, it's hard. They, like the, there's just not enough demand out there to consume the entire amount of supply but when you flip it around and you look at like you know who's willing to sell me whole herring for pet food uh the supply is limited and therefore me as if i want to make a premium product now i must compete and like pay premium prices mm. for that 
especially just because typically all the producers are dealing with the human chain. So to catch their attention and, and redirect their product to me, I'm gonna have to do something, and a lot of times that's like pay a premium. Uh, just <coughs> how open do you think the pet industry would be to alternative species? Or alternative components yeah. of the fish. How about green crab? Herring is a <laughs> Well, it, it that, yeah, that's a good example. But uh, part of the reason for this whole process was um, herring is not a species that, I mean, it's not growing in population, plus uh, quotas are down and all, all that sort of stuff. So there's a problem we have with the herring industry mm -hmm. um, that we all face. But um, there's a lot of alternative species, and I know, you know, guys like Phil. Well, yeah, dog. It could be anything, redfish, whatever. Is there an opportunity to introduce a new species that has nutritional, absolutely, uh, aspects to it and sell it in a different way? Yeah, you just highlight the sustainability aspect of it. So, like the company out west, they have an. E it's called an eco line, but 20% of the food is black fly larva. So they're using that because the nutritional aspects are all there, but on a sustainability level, um, so they, you're doing the exact same thing, take the, you know, the less desirable fish or whatever, and you and come at it from a sustainability level. Because a lot of what, I mean, our discussions with the initial group that we had around the racks, like if the pet food industry wants more than the rack, if they want the whole fish, then I think we have to start looking at an alternate species yeah. Yeah. or something that we can <coughs> utilize for Insect proteins on the, on the growth as well, <laughs> no. both human and pet. Yeah, and we've, we've had a little bit of discussion around that industry. Yeah, um, so soldier fly and crickets, are they really starting to make an impact now? They are in certain spaces. The, I'm not sure in the pet food space, but it, the... <coughs> For if, you, if you see a bag of uh, cricket protein on the shelf at the superstore, you know it's made some impact. Uh, yeah, it's true. People yeah. are using cricket protein to make bread alternatives mm -hmm. right now. There's treats that use crickets, <coughs> and there's foods that foods out there like canned food, um, dry food, and yeah. raw food that uses black soldier fly larvae. Yeah. <coughs> they're also like a good fat source of that larva as well. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, to one up point on your, you know, when people are coming to you. I think back to my days at Law Blah, Blah when, when people came to my office and wanted and were begging me to be on the shelf, I had all the power, right? <clears throat> so what you need to do, and easy for me to say, because I'm not a seafood processor, but I think what you need to do is, is find what where is the value and flip it around so that you have something that they want, mm. as opposed to them coming to you and saying, you know that stuff that you're paying to get rid of right now, uh, I'll give you 10 cents for that, and that, that doesn't really help your business that much. So what are what is it that they're looking for? And then you may have to make some changes. I think you referenced, you know, there's some changes in your business you might have to make to, to change the value of what you have there, or perhaps add something to it or whatever. But you've got to flip it around and say, what are these pet food companies? If you're going to sell as an ingredient, you're going to say, what do they need? And, and, and how do I position so I have what they need as opposed to them looking for a fire set? Mm. So uh, earlier, I think in a couple of your presentations, you guys mentioned the correlation between food, human food, and pet food. Is there a movement on the supplement side? Because there's definitely a movement on supplements for human consumption. Um, and at a very much higher level value chain, can we do something like that in the pet food industry that may be underserved and, and work in a space that's not? Because I, I look at the nutritional components in, in a typical fish and all the all the things that make that up. Is there a way to create a supplement that's manageable to give a dog or a cat or whatever? Is that a market do you think is interesting? or? Or is it just Doug Jones thinking? <laughs> <laughs> my, my guess would be that, that they're, I mean, you probably know better, but their supplements are refined to the point where it's a pretty high dollar, yeah. high dollar uh, ingredient yeah. already. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I don't know how much traction it would get to, in the pet and in, in, uh, <coughs> how, how regulatory would handle it. Yeah. Yeah. 
just a thought because of the relation. Where I would say the supplements food. and pet could be the next evolution of the treat category. <coughs> so because yeah, a treat is that, always a, but now you call it a supplement, all of a sudden it has more value to it, right? Yeah. Well, if there's a health. Omega-3. There's a health uh, marketing aspect to that, and it's a treat at the same time. To me, that's where I would develop a business. But that's we used to sell granola bars, now we sell protein bars. You know? And they're the same thing. Well. <laughs> <laughs> so, so at Perennia, we've seen a lot of interest in the supplement stuff. Yeah. You know, the probiotics, mm. um, it's all about preserving, you know, it, like whatever we're eating. Yeah. 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 But I think the problem maybe is challenging for get the health claim. For any kind of human dietary supplement, you need those kind of health claim from the authority. But for the pet food, no. you want your parents to pay a premium product, but uh, without kind of authority claim, that would be maybe more, that is maybe the challenge. Yeah, yeah and, and you don't necessarily, uh, I don't feel that you need to have that, that health claim necessarily. Mm -hmm. It's a marketing statement that yeah. you're, you're going to have. Yeah. You use yeah. this all the time in the sports industry where you, you're not making health claim. You always have a disclaimer, but it, it's basically a marketing push to make you believe that this is what it's going to do for your animal uh, or your professional baseball player. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's, uh, it's evidence-based for our human. Yeah. They, people naturally make a link to their kids. Yeah. yeah. I, I, as soon as you say omega-3s and you connect it to pet, they automatically know what that means. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting to me from an entrepreneur's perspective, um, but I just don't know whether the pet food in industry would embrace yeah. that. Supplementation is increasing um, as, as a category uh, with regards to tying it to like using seafood waste or some, like, something like that. Um, the challenge becomes like th there's not enough movement of supplements to want to, to use up the supply right. of seafood waste and then it's the processing involved to turn that seafood waste into into something usable in the supplements but to speak to your idea there's like another trend so to speak is like meal toppers yeah and then that's the right. way that's you yeah that's kind of what we're doing so you kind of use your meal topper yeah. but then to differentiate your meal topper that's where you add like this contains omegas or this contains something where yeah. there's right. that intrinsic health benefit there's a little three dollar package that you just sprinkle on the, uh, that's what yeah. i would see as a consumer okay. right um it's like putting yeah. salt and vinegar on your popcorn someone yeah there's a product coming out um, called Top It. Literally, it's called Top It, and it's in one of those like baby food twist things. Oh, yeah. It must be like a liquid or a paste or something, and you just, it's a one use, which is bad for packaging, but yeah. you squeeze it on top of the food, and it, it's supposed to have vitamins or whatever. If we did that, Margo, something like that probably would have to be tested in a lab or even in a, a canvas bar's kitchen to actually identify what if you want to make the claim that this is going to improve the health of your pet, you've got to have some sort of science behind it, wouldn't you think? It, it should have some science behind it, yeah. yeah. It doesn't mean it will, but it should definitely always have science behind it. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, guaranteed analysis, and if it's a particular, you know, um, mega-9 versus a mega-6, you know, that should be yeah. brought out on your market. Yeah, sure. And some of that can be done at, at a perennia facility or the Canada Smart Kitchen or by a food tech, right? That's right. Yep. We've actually had requests recently. But usually, when one person comes to us with something, then you know, a month there's another five come yeah. with the same new idea. <laughs> uh, and dog beverages are being requested. Dog beverages. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, they're, they're playing off the bone broth uh, trend in uh, human, yeah. and they're just putting a canned cup, can bone broth in it. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm thinking about the practical challenges here. So if you've got a fish plant and there's a large volume, or you know, you've got to get the fillet off and just make the highest possible quality fillet. You don't really want to deal with the uh, the waste, the rack, all that stuff. You don't want to put it in your freezer. You, you don't want to tie up expensive real estate for that. So do you guys experience, like, and probably Canada's first case of Crania, or perhaps what you've dealt with in your business, have you seen other ways of stabilizing the fish waste stream that protects the oils or the proteins that, you know, is there unique cool ways you can do it in situ at a plant? 
to do that, or you have to pick it up every day and send it somewhere and render it? Maybe you know about that, I'll find it out. Pretty much all of the methods are time and energy consuming. <coughs> um, so just pick which one is the least. Uh, and, and freezing is, if you're already freezing in space, might be the best way to go. But uh, things like drying and powderizing and, and uh, rendering is probably cheap. Uh, Big picture, is it? Can I can I answer answer that? I think there's a gentleman from University of Cape Breton who is doing a pilot study on uh, making a slurry of the uh, fish waste into uh, four or five day shelf life product to get it to market, to get it to further processing. Mm. It's not very expensive, you don't think? I'm not sure what the cost would be, yeah. but I know he's working on it. Are you familiar with that, uh, Phil? Well, the fish silage that they've made before, it's like you just, it, you know, uh, dust the pH so then it doesn't spoil and you just keep adding to it and take fish silage. It's like a silage has been used for a long time. For a long, yeah. long time. Successfully and not successfully. Yeah. If there's acid preservation, you can do on site. Mm -hmm. from it's not on expensive, site. really, to do. Not expensive. You left kind of with a liquid slurry. Can do short term, long term preservation. Yeah. That leads to its own problems. <laughs> Brian, those blocks you showed us, I think Jeff and I had been through, you had those frozen blocks. Mm -hmm. Were those, are those delivered to you or are those something that you. No, we freeze them on site. You freeze them on site. Does freezing actually handle some of that longevity of those? Oh, if yeah. it's frozen in a quick mm -hmm. manner? The plate freezers and stuff like that they use them there. Well, it would certainly extend the shelf life for that. Yeah. It wouldn't uh, complete it without oxidation, but it'll certainly slow it to the point where you can have a good supply chain. I was mm -hmm. just thinking there's a lot of producers. You've got refrigeration at your plant as, as well, and I think B and most places have some sort of refrigeration or flash freezing type of mm. facility. I'm not sure. not in those you know, the volumes we'd be talking about. That no, no. In our case. Yeah. Yeah. But that's a high energy consumption and yeah. uh, expensive shipping because you're shipping in person. Yeah, it is. Well, uh, yeah. In a perfect world, we would be making all this product right here. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 So. I think I can add a few comments on this one because I've worked with fish oil for quite a long time. My research is basically trying to stabilize fish oil. If you think about the stability of the proof of omega-3 fatty acid, there is top fat, uh, four enemies, or the, the, the way leading to the oxidation. The top one is the oxygen, the second one is the temperature, the third one is the metal ions, those kind of stuff. There are some of the other initiator stuff. So from the cost per perspective, freezing, if you have capacity, uh, capacity, if you can freeze it quickly, that should be the cheapest way to um, maintain the quality uh, instead of just leaving it in room temperature exposed to the oxygen. <coughs> and another way is try to maybe if you have come storage capacity, reduce the oxygen, because the top one, like I said, is the oxygen. Mm. Yeah. That you need oxygen to initiate that chain reaction of the proof of uh, antioxidants, uh, proof of uh, fatty, acid, uh, fatty acid. So if you have some kind of capacity to remove, storing a more inert uh, atmosphere way, that is also not a cheap way to, for you to, uh, to pr uh, protect your byproducts. So similar to what how they, up in the valley they have controlled atmospheric storage for apples. Yeah. Yeah. No yeah. oxygen. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> so if you have really limited oxygen, that is a, a not a cheap way uh, compared with uh, the freezing. Just freezing is more definitely more uh, high energy consumption way, but right. more inert, low temp, uh, uh, low than room temperature. That is another way to store extend the. Uh, your bar product shelf life in a more efficient way, maybe. Mm. Mm. It seems like this is a volume industry. It's hard for any yeah. one processor to take it on. Yeah. I was wondering, this is probably not a fair question, but if I were to try and supply fish racks or even whole fish to a pet manufacturer, how much tonnage would I have to supply to them? Ballpark. What are we talking? You know, how many tons of fish? Well, uh, not not 
tons. Like I can tell you from a raw standpoint, like <clears throat> raw companies do like two thousand pounds of food a day, like okay. anywhere from two thousand to eight thousand pounds a day. Okay. And they don't. It, it's not. They're not running fish every day, right? Because right. they're gonna do you know chicken, then next day do beef. So okay. <clears throat> it's not not high high volume. Like okay. that's the. So maybe that's an opportunity then. As long as you're scalable. Yeah. You don't want to lock, or they're not going to want to lock into somebody who, who's already produced the maximum amount mm -hmm. and then they can't expand. To, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, quick question for Dog or Mother. So, from the industry, can you give us a big picture? What is the, the current practice in the seafood processor? How much of the waste byproduct generated now and what is their? Uh, usage or uh, utilization of those kind of byproducts, so most of them go to landfill or fish meal or whatever. <coughs> well, I think it, Very good question. it yeah, <laughs> it, 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 I think it varies across yeah. Nova Scotia, but a, a lot of where this all came from was that we a lot of our waste product goes into the lobster fishery as bait product and, and uh, things like that, but. Um, Sean, I think you said it's a 30% yield on a haddock. On, on the way we process the, ha the haddock with the, you know, take the bones out, so it leaves about 30% uh, fillet yield, and then you have the rest is waste. Yeah. So we sell twice the amount of fish waste than we do fresh fillets or frozen fillets. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're looking at, uh, and, you know, and why... I started asking Perennia and other, other people about this, this situation was the mink industry was taking a lot of our uh, fish waste and you know the, the lobster uh, people were buying a lot of it for bait but then you know the, in the summer when the, the local lobster season wasn't on we were you know pretty much all the fish waste was going into mink feed production mm. so that's been hurting very badly unfortunately and so we're looking for alternative areas for, for you know, getting rid of our fish waste. So this is, and the pet food was an obvious choice. However, uh, I think everybody had the same idea. So I, we had a customer in the States who was buying quite a bit of fish waste for pet food production. But then when the industry, the mink industry went uh, hurt really badly, a lot of the, that production went into Everybody tried to pile into the the pet food production, so as an oversupply, I think right London. now of uh, fish waste into pet food. So I think that's a quite a big bottleneck there. So I'm not sure how it's gonna if that's a short term issue or that's going to be a long term issue. Yeah, we we kind of discussed through this process that we didn't feel that there was one solution for this. We think that. Yeah. A, a typical scenario where Sean might be producing all this the seventy percent waste. Um, can he be in the nutraceutical market? Can he be in the pet food market? Can he, and and we're trying to see what what the best value is. And we're taking a lot of lessons from uh, Iceland, who are using a hundred percent. Now it's a different circumstance over there, but we're trying to learn um, how they're utilizing the full species rather than sell everything as lobster bait, you know, because certainly there's going to be a, a flood in the market and they're going to be looking for alternatives to, to certain types of species. So um, that's where this all came from. So one thing I do know, Sean, is there are currently companies out there looking for byproduct waste to fill capacity requirements for meal and oil plants that are in place. Whether it's a pricing issue or a lack of communication issue, I'm not sure. Uh, I really don't know. But if there's seafood companies looking for that waste currently, and, and they've approached Pernia to, to help with that, you know, really it needs to be more of a cooperative kind of working together situation where if you've got X number of tons per week and this plant over here needs X number of tons per week. I mean there's gotta be some kind of and and while you're using your waste that way, in the meantime people like Johnny Rowland, our new PhD food scientist, extraction specialist, and uh, uh, Sarah and myself and Marilyn and Ashley can come up with processes and learn from others on nutraceuticals, 
kind of higher value. The, grab the low-hanging fruit first. Uh, pet food, uh, fish meal, fish oil, and uh, give us a little while to work on some of the higher value products. We want it to be, it, this is truly industry-led. This is yeah. industry saying we have a problem, yeah. um, but we want an entrepreneurial solution. Mm -hmm. You know, if there's 10 entrepreneurs out there that develop 10 different products and they all can be sourced and, and built locally, we all benefit. Mm -hmm. And that's the idea is we grow the economy using an underutilized aspect of, a, of a, our main industries. And uh, if we can do that, <laughs> we, we change the game a little bit. You, know. you look at how South International uh, how it's being used internationally as well. We worked with a company in France on a, uh, they were selling product directly uh, only to Western Africa. Um, the product was coming out of Norway and they call it uh, stockfish. So basically it's a filleted fish, the carcass is just dried and they use that in, in virtually everything in, in Western, like in Nigeria and Ghana. Mm. Um, the price is going up because Norway couldn't keep up with the supply and demand, so uh, we were asked to do a sort of convenience product based on that. But it says to me that there's probably a market for Canadian. If you were just to take your carcasses that 60% and dry them, <coughs> there might be a market uh, uh, offshore for that. Yeah. Iceland has a similar one. <laughs> Is there a, and I don't know this at all, but the pet food industry in markets like Japan where Canadian products get a premium? Is it? Is there anything there where you know your Canadian fish has a, a different view in some parts of the world than it does here, yeah. right? Where it has maybe more of a premium uh, perception, where pet food made from Canadian fish may seem to be something you want to feed to the important dogs or something. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, actually, the Japanese dogs. It's, a, it's yeah. a good point, and I'll put, put Phil on the spot. But, uh, when I go through Phil's plan because he, he exports worldwide but he's looking at those things that we won't eat mm -hmm. you know it was uh, and I don't know if I'm allowed to oh <laughs> yeah the swim bladder yeah uh, fish brush. yeah so uh, a typical Canadian isn't going to eat that but he's found a way to market that as a as a product this especially the Asian it's an Asian market, market yeah. but within Canada yeah oh, yeah, yeah we're okay. Finding that um, the Asian market within Canada would like to buy the product from Canada instead of bringing it in from Asia. Mm. Right. So if it can be produced locally, you produce thing products that we're not familiar with, but yeah. you're filling a need that has high <coughs> value, <coughs> but it's a yeah. product that um, we would never have thought of. Then, right. um, but they like it to be produced yeah. in the North America. So, but there's yeah. probably that same scenario for the pet industry too where some of those have those nutritional components but we won't eat them as Canadians that uh, we could probably utilize in some way. Julie? Uh, this is a question more from the whole audience and not related <coughs> to, to Pat if you don't mind for a <coughs> second but I seem to remember there was a market for uh, fertilizers particularly the phosphorus part. So the, has anyone investigated that the possibility of using the, the waste into fertilizers? I know the mussel industry, they're not doing any processing at all. They're just taking undersized mussels and basically plowing them, plowing them under. Uh, so acting as a fertilizer, but, uh, there's also some companies that are doing mussel mud as a fertilizer. Hmm. Is that primarily the shells or the actual animal? It's the whole thing because they're undersized, they have no use for them. Right. About a million pounds a year that's going in the garbage or getting plowed. Are they getting any decent value for that? As a they're not getting anything for it. But they're, they're mitigating their cost to dispose of that waste. Yeah. Well, we've come to learn that that's an excellent loft to be. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. There might be a market for that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's true. I've heard that a lot though, people that I've been talking to a lot, I, I think of my grandmother who would get me to pick vegetables in her garden 
and it was there was no dirt in them. It was all seaweed and mussel shells and lobster shells, and she'd grow the biggest potatoes and stuff. So I'm thinking, oh. <laughs> maybe maybe she knew something 70 years ago that yeah. we didn't know. So any other questions? Uh, yeah. What, is, what, do you, what do you guys see as like the best processing method to maintain the nutritional value? Like, kind of make comments on like rendering, cooking might like, diminish the value, or like freeze drying, or what, what, what in your perspective, your experience? Probably raw first, right? But freeze drying is pretty good, but it's really expensive process. Mm -hmm. um, so you have a good outcome product, but your market's going to be a lot smaller because you're, you, uh, you have to charge that premium for it. Um, but from a nutritional standpoint, it's probably going to be second to raw. Freeze drying? It's, it, it's basically a food line. Yeah. <coughs> There's other drying methods too, becoming less expensive, like microwave assisted infrared drying. Mm. Um, they're not, well, there's some use in Nova Scotia, um, not in the fish industry, but in the berry industry. Um, Pardon me? Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so there's all kinds of ways to dry it, all cost money, it's all energy. But this is a particular reserve for nutrients, free drying, free seasons. So any other questions for the panel? The, the two sessions that you're going to lead at the minister's conference, is that because the, the province is ex, was it ex, uh, scared? <laughs> scared? <laughs> it's like, the, what's, the, what's the real interest? Is it, is it because they see an opportunity or? Well, I think it comes from a bit of both, and Jeff, you can, you can address this too, but we've had uh, numerous conversations with Keith Collow, the minister of fisheries, and, and what he likes about this process is that it's not, it, it's being led by industry, it's being led by the Bryans and the Sean's and the Phil's and, and stuff coming with the problem. Because sometimes at the, and this is just my opinion, but sometimes at the ministerial level, you're not hearing the truth. And I know that's hard to imagine in politics, but but uh, <laughs> the the thing is, if you hear it from a processor who is actually experiencing it, it, it's different. So I think in our discussions with Keith, that approach um, is is doing two things. It's maybe creating entrepreneurial opportunity, but it's helping um, one of the most lucrative uh, pieces of the Nova Scotia economy is the producers in southwestern Nova. So um, I'm, I'm glad you said Southwest Nova it's not just Southwest Nova. I mean, no. right now I think well, people like Sean and they'll say, look, we can send this stuff to lots of people. Yeah. We can. Then you ask the question, do you think that's the highest and best value you can get from seventy percent of your biomass? And then there's usually a pause. <laughs> yeah. So we would like to bring in experts from Iceland to talk about that at the Ministry's Conference. Yeah. At the other end of this province, where there's a lot of shellfish byproduct, <laughs> it's, oh, it's, it's much more of an emergency there because municipalities are, are getting a lot of pressure to ban shellfish waste going into compost or landfills. And it's not inconceivable that within a year or so, that shellfish will be banned from those public uh, spaces, which would be crippling to the lobster and crab processing industry in, in northern Nova Scotia. There was 30, 32 million pounds is what they told us in Cape Breton of waste. So it, that's why the minister, that's what the industry is saying, we got a problem, the minister wants to be responsive and we're trying to build the agenda for that conference. Mm -hmm. So we're looking for any and all ideas that can be used. And we're looking to those jurisdictions where we hear they're doing good things with it, like Norway, like Iceland. Can we learn from them? Yeah. And what will apply here? What's applicable for us? We need right. to make it, we need to regionalize it, what will work here. And so that there's going to be a number of speakers coming into that, those sessions, talking about what they do. So we'll take a look and see if it's something maybe we can replicate here. Yeah, it, it's not about us individually being experts, because yeah. I'm certainly not an expert, really but, but it's convening panels like this and, and bringing in other industry experts because um, it, it's been done in other places. We yeah. don't have to reinvent the wheel, but I would like to see 
you know, everybody increase their business or, or, or fully utilize some of our facilities <coughs> in southwestern Nova and put us on the map as the premium, whether it's pet food industry or, or whatever. We, we have uh, the supply and we have the product and we have all the things in our favor. How do we create a commercial opportunity uh, where one doesn't exist today? Yeah. So. We're exploring one waste stream at the western end. We're looking at potential energy generation from anaerobic digestion. So that's a possible road too, and it would likely be for product that you otherwise like had no value for. Mm. But if you want to talk to me about that later, we can discuss. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to have a chance, like, um, <coughs> certainly we're not pushing anybody out the door. It's a chance for us to do a bit of networking and discussion. We still have food, coffee, and all that stuff. So um, sometimes the best things happen after we stop flapping our gums. <laughs> so, um, but uh, if there's no other questions, you can, you can kind of mingle, have some food, tour the space, uh, ask questions. Um, there's loads of talent around the room. Um, you know, half of Perennia is here. <laughs> you know, so. see them. <laughs> yeah, that's all that matters, right? <laughs> Southwestern Nova. Yeah. So, uh, but ask questions. I think everybody's <coughs> sticking around, so um, it's a good chance. Doug, yeah. Do you, want to hand the uh, you go ahead. So, uh, the surveys uh, for today's session, Danielle's going to hand them out if you could. Uh, it just helps get some feedback on kind of where we go from here. Um, so we appreciate the feedback. If you if you fill them out, just leave them on the table, and, and Danielle and Aaron and I will pick them up afterwards. But yeah. hopefully you got lots of good stuff. I got lots of good stuff out of today, so we appreciate you coming and stick around, and I'll buy you a coffee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just mostly, fish. mostly had it. Mostly had it. So I just want to give you a picture. You said 
during the like, now it's the season, you see some of them go to the lobster bay, so they just buy the frames or buy all of the stuff or just specific, specific parts for them. No, the whole frames. Yeah. And they have the guts are in. The guts are in and the whole frames. Yeah, and uh, they freeze some some guys freeze it. Oh, okay. So yeah. then they can they, they just use that as okay. Yeah. And uh, what is the volume in the summer? Well, what is the peak volume? Well, the volume uh, we have uh, 25,000 pounds a day. Wow, 25,000 pounds a day. In the, in the busy season, yeah. In the busy season, is that the winter or the summer? In the summer. In the summer. But, but, uh, but this time of year, we sell, we have a uh, we have big production, but there's a lot of lobster bait. Yeah. People buy for lobster bait. Or buy a lot for the lobster bait. Right now. Yeah, right now. I know it's the season, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and in the summer, yeah, we'll have 25,000 pounds a day. For the whole summer? Uh, mostly, yeah. And uh, what is the what is current you're dealing with this one now? After the mink industry, I know you mentioned the mink industry. Now it's close to the land here, or no, no, but the, the, the mink I still buy some of it. Oh, they still buy some yeah. of it. So, so, so far, is there anything anything with the land here? No, never, never. So you can sell most of your stuff basically right now, right, right now. now. And what is from the what is the price stuff? Is, uh, I think you get uh, eleven cents picked up for for mink feed. 11 cents for the link fee. But I think we as much as 30 cents for fishermen for lobster bait. 30 cents for the lobster fishermen. Oh, I guess that's a, there's demand in winter, there's yeah. demand in the... Yeah. In the, in the I think we'll sell for like 15, 15 cents in the summer for the guys using it for lobster bait. I think it's 15, 15 cents for the I think so. for freezing for the lobster in the winter yeah. time. Yeah. Oh, okay. fish it in the summer. Not a whole lot, but a bit. Few guys do it. Oh, few guys, yeah, maybe just kind of they deserve it for the material. Yeah, and the customers in the fall. Oh, fall okay. area. Is it in the south? I'm not sure. For except neutral. Is there any other process here? Yeah, the you have no way to deal with the bypass. The end of the land. I not not. A, I don't know of anybody right now. Oh, okay. But we are we're concerned with you know. Uh, we're concerned with the mink industry. Yeah, the mink industry is down, yeah. Yeah, because we have bigger volume, we have big volume. Is there mink industry that processes the normal fish? Do you have some more mention? Is that normal or different? Uh, no. our, our fish goes to uh, Ryan Sonia at uh, Seacrest. Brian? Ryan Sonia? Oh, oh, okay. Right there. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. Now we sell it to a company and they sell it over there and they do mink, the, the, the mink feed. Who's the process of the mink industry? Well, he's one of them, yeah. Oh, he's the process. Uh, yeah. Oh, so they buy it and the process and sell it to Ming Industry. Yeah. Okay, Brian. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's about mm, okay, great. Great. And? Yeah, just for me, Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of a new start Okay. Enough, uh, ideas, try to see whether we can develop some products to so make okay. this uh, lobster fishing more sustainable. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Did, did you, did you, were you part of the. Uh, uh, yeah, lobster challenge? I missed that one. Oh, I missed yeah. yeah. two days, whatever. Oh, okay. that one. So, uh, I really did want to be in that one, but I missed the deadline. So oh, okay. I cannot be in that one. Whatever. Okay. Just not too much in my own company. Okay. Yeah, that's probably Sean. Yeah. Sean, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. I don't have a card. No, it's just me. I'm one of the inshore fisheries. Inshore fisheries, Sean, yeah. So, is it off right from here? Uh, 40 minutes. 40 minutes from here. The lower west from the field. Okay. Is it possible maybe she ships some samples to me or? Yeah, you just, in, in my email is yeah, well, you Sean. I found it. I found it. You have website. I think. Yeah. 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 yeah I think it's yeah. funny. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, then I think this name of the one of the people. Don Tomo. Don Tomo, yeah. I have one friend from me. He's uh, in the storm maker. He's the same boss name as Don Tomo. It's got a big family name in that area. Yes, yeah. 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 Oh, okay. Yes, yeah. that's it. That's it. That's it. That's it.